have enough wind to sail by once we start making our way so we don't even have to paddle off the beach i'm just using the paddle to kind of turn us around but once you start to just get a little bit you can actually kind of see the change in the water yeah so that's i guess probably watch i bet that's the point where as soon as we kind of hit that we'll start to kind of pick up some speed What was the walk around this morning? Not too bad. Oh, beauty, yeah. yeah. Sunrise is awesome. The walk was good. Couple deep spots. You guys want to say aloha? Anybody who's oh, watching? Love it. Oh. Kind of hitting out of that shadow of the mountain, right? And you can kind of feel the, the, the true wind, right? There it is. So if you had to make a plan before you left the beach, what are some things you could use? Because it's hard to tell what the wind's doing on the beach from, from feel. But what are some other indicators you can use? The trees, exactly, right? You can look at the tall trees and see what direction they're blowing. The water. You can look on the water and see what patterns it's making. Because of sailing, the one rule, right? The one rule is you can never sail where? What direction? Okay, you no, know, you can sail north. You can never sail exactly where the wind's coming from. So if you had to point, I want everyone with their hand to point, where do you think the wind is coming from right now? Right? Kind of in this general direction, you can kind of tell by the, the way the trees have been growing and been blowing. So you can look at someone's hair, right? So we can't sail directly in that direction. But we can go at an angle to it, and we can eventually make our way that way, but we're just going to have to go at an angle to the wind, right? Have you ever heard, like, the term trade winds? The reason that was is because, like, Christopher Columbus's ships and those things, those big square sails, they really could only sail with the winds at their backs. A Polynesian, with a sail design like this, we're sailing up against, like, up against at an angle to the wind. That's why essentially from Tahiti to Hawaii, you're sailing against the wind a little bit at an angle the whole trip. But the trade winds, that was their trade route. They can only go one direction. They can only go the wind at their backs. And that was it. So that's kind of how we get uh, what our trade winds come from. Is 
Does anybody know the name of the bay we are in? The bay we're in. So, I'll give you a hint. The first word is Mauna. Mauna Lua Bay. What does Mauna Lua mean? Mauna means what? And then you have Ekahi and Lua. So, two mountains. What two mountains do you think it's called? I'm giving you a hint by pointing my camera that way. <laughs> so, where's Mauna Lua Bay? You guys want to say those? Kohe Lepe Lepe. Yeah? Kohe Lepe Lepe. That's the Coco Creator, yeah? Coco Creator. And then what's the what's uh, Coco Head over there? It's called Kuo Mo Spine Okane. Kuo Mo Okane. Kuo Mo Okane. Kuo Mo Okane. So it means spine, but what else does Mo mean? Spine. 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 <laughs> we just we just had it on the on the canoe. Lizard, right? So if you guys next time you drive around, if you guys ever go hike this mountain, look into Hanama Bay. Hanama is also you can pronounce it Hanahuma, which is a uh, arm wrestling, right? So it talks about this story: of these two chiefs that were arm wrestling, and they're so evenly matched that none none can gain. Favor. So they actually were arm wrestling so long where they got turned into mo'o and it became their tails that were wrestling. If you look out to the bay, it looks like two heads of lizards and right over here where you drive over, it looks like their tails are still wrestling. Yeah? So it's either kuo mo'o, hane, it's talking about the backbone of the lizard. Do you two do some mo'o wrestling sometimes with two of you guys? <laughs> Koa le hua, a little bit? Yeah, a little bit of wrestling. Oh. <laughs> With your moho tails. Oh. It's your brother, sister. That's how you do it. Freshwater springs from the lava tubes that are just sending fresh water up. And historically, people would know where those were and could collect those. And of course, the living things would sometimes congregate around those, yep. those little vents. So really important. Oh, we got some paddlers coming in. Thank you. 
If you guys go to like Ottawa, Yacht Harbor, or see any other sail boat, it's weird. They put the biggest part of sail near the bottom. So this is a true Polynesian design where we tried to put as much material that we have high up to catch the wind, but also to keep it dry, right? Sails would have been woven out of like a Mau Hala, a pandanus leaf, right? Traditionally, so it can get wet, it doesn't like getting wet. Okay. We're just going to turn around right here. A good view looking into our valley right here. All of a sudden, it starts to kind of get a little too close to you. You might be in trouble if those guys see us fishing in front of their valley. Up. 80 feet of water. Well, it was a really sustainable way to fish that they would set these traps, and the traps had a funnel kind of thing. So the fish could swim in, but it would kind of get confused on the way out, but it still had an area to swim. And they would check on them probably about every week or so, and so we'd go with them. But what was really cool is this is before GPS or that they could afford a GPS so all their traps were set by landmark. So I remember being a little kid and then kind of have this little paper book and they'd be like, okay, red top of this hotel, I'm in mean, this apartment building with this, you know, shiny window side of here and boom, the thing was there, you know. So, and it was a really sustainable way because they would, from the, when the trap is still closed, they could shoot the ones they wanted then they would open and all the rest would go out, right? They'd only, it's a very selective way to, to fish and that was like kind of what we ate you know and if you talk to anybody that fishes out here now like Kilwini Lee those guys these guys go fish for hours they don't catch anything so it's like it's crazy that um, we just haven't been seeing a way to probably even farm wise too right there's just not a lot of ag space there's not a farm space so the transition I've seen to this place is being an area that you could sustain and live off of and unfortunately now it's kind of just an area we remember those stories, but it's kind of like we're trying to scratch our heads and figure out how to bring it back, right? Um, it's cool to see places like on the east side where they're actually restoring whole Aupua from Malkun Makai with their fish ponds or lo'i and even up, up deep. So slowly we're trying to figure out how we can do that on this side. Um, but yeah, actually the largest fish pond in all of Polynesia is right here. So if you guys ever know like all the, um, the area back by Costco, that was, um, uh, what was the name of the Lua. The bridge, the, the makaha for the opening for the fish pond was right <clears throat> as you kind of go over this bridge, you kind of pass uh, out back and the uh, storage place and you go over a bridge. That was the opening. So that was the largest fish pond we had. It probably could have provided enough fish for this whole area until we um, developed it, right? Even the name Hoi Kai, that was um, Mr. Kaiser who named it after himself. He just shortened it from Kaiser to Kai and called it after. So without people, you know, just seeing for development, so there's that and then we'll look back, we'll turn around this way. Talking about food. You guys ever had friends or live in Wailupe Circle? You guys ever been to like a place over there? So Wailupe, the peninsula, and Yuiki, those are fish ponds. These three off um, kapa patterns um, were actually, they excavated a cave the Fish Museum did in the 50s in, in New Valley. And they followed some Oe Kapala, these bamboo prints. So these are actually three prints from the area. We're not really sure what they mean, but uh, we have them like on our gate at the fish pond and different things, so we thought we'd put them on the sale. Yeah, everyone, not really like a language is kind of different depending on what areas what bring stuff in. But this one that looks like a dice, I like to think about um, 
kind of looks like the Southern Cross. So Nainoa Thompson, who is you know, the, the head of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, this is where he grew up, this area. And when in, he was 26 years old, Hokulea had already sailed to Tahiti under the um, navigation of Mao Piailu, right? So from Satawal, who had been a master navigator his whole life. He wanted to learn how to navigate. Essentially, Papa Mao told him, you're too young, you gotta send me your kids if you really wanna learn how to navigate. You're 26 already, you're too old to learn everything I'd have to teach you. But, you know, seeing that he was probably the most, the best candidate, Papa Mao actually moved here. They lived in New Valley. He moved in with Nino's parents. And for about three to four years, they spent every day together. So this is one of their favorite spots. They would come down to study because from here, you have a really nice long horizon. Some, a lot of beaches, sometimes like Waikiki, or like you only have a small, you think about like Kaimana, it's really like a maybe small horizon, right? Over here, you have a, they would go here, they would go to Lanai Lookout. They actually had the keys to go uh, drive all the way up to like the lighthouse. But after all his studying, and, and he'd also be in the planetarium, and I know he was really trying to figure out, he could use the North Star and the height, he could measure the height of the North Star off the horizon, you know your latitude. But in case it was cloudy, he wanted something in the south, and he kept trying to figure out, couldn't do it in the planetarium. And it's this wild story that he was sleeping and he had a dream, and he said it was like Tetris. He saw this, the Southern Cross rise, and it went like doot, 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 and it put himself so he measured in his dream the distance from the top star to the bottom star and the sun cross. If you're in Hawaii, only if you're in Hawaii, is the same distance as the bottom star to the horizon. So he woke up and he ran down here and he said he was like in his bibbities or like the you know, and he grabbed red nail polish because he was a fisherman. He used to paint red in the eyes of his lures. And he marked before the sun cross rose on this street sign over at the park where you guys parked where he thought it would rise. And boom, the thing came up just like exactly where it is. So now that's a marker for us as navigators that if you're in the latitude of Hawaii and you see the Southern Cross, it's usually about maybe about six degrees off the horizon when it's fully standing up. You measure the distance from the top star to the bottom star is exactly the same as from the bottom star to the horizon. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. so I like to think, it kind of reminds me of that Southern Cross story. You know? all kind of cool stories about coming down here and he would make a star compass on a glow sticks and like one time he fell asleep in it and he got woken up by a police officer and he was thought he was doing some like seance or something because he just has this circle of glow sticks and he fell asleep but then you know he tapped into him so the guy would come down and listen to him talk about the stars so he had like a little bit of an audience just to practice you know practice and talk to somebody so you don't go crazy <laughs> pretty good but for the most part they're overboard and then they'll say okay I know we're traveling let's say five knots this is where the map comes to play let's just say we left here at 7 a.m this morning in the distance in the direction of Tahiti just to make it super easy we, we travel five knots the whole time for 24 hours tomorrow at 7 a.m out on the ocean you would say okay five knots 24 hours I know we're 120 miles to our direction that is always something that the navigator is doing in their head. You'd be lucky if you travel five knots. More, more so it's like eight for a couple hours, then three knots, then six. So you have this mental picture in your head of how far away you are from where you last drew your spot. Whether that's Hawaii, or you have like a really good reading on, a, a, you know you're at the equator or something like that. So you try and break it up in your head, it's called dead reckoning, right? How far am I? from where I last do it and we make a plan ahead of time on maps. We say, okay, for the first first part of the voyage, I'm gonna hold I wanna hold this heading until I get it get get to let's say 10 degrees north. Right? We're at 21 degrees in Hawaii, but for the first part of the trip, I want to keep this heading. And then whenever you kind of get confirmation, you don't go backwards. You kind of are confident in your decision, you kind of forget the rest. Otherwise you drive yourself crazy. Did I make the right call a couple days back, right? When I said we were going this fast, it's like, you just have confidence in yourself and forget the rest, right? So that's kind of how navigation goes. Always looking at what direction you're going, here are the speeds, and the third part is the dead record. Do you guys have any questions about like life on the canoe? Yeah. <laughs>
shower and salt. You know that feeling you come from the beach, you ever shower? That's all the feeling. Nah, it's actually not that bad. We should do a quick bathroom run for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Show them how to do it. Yeah. What's the maximum length of the age? Like, like so, realistically do. Yeah, I mean, most of the times when we're actually navigating tradition, before the worldwide voyage, we were just thinking about Polynesia, right? And they went to Japan, which was like farther. And then they all went to Alaska. But during the worldwide voyage, I mean, there were some distances. I think the longest one had to be either stretched to Brazil. That's right from Africa, from South I want to say, yeah, from South Africa. It wasn't the one where you guys went towards the uh, Mozambique. From yeah, it was what was that the tiny Indian island Russia? that you guys were at? Right oh, Mauritius. Me? No, it was, it was, well, there's also the one went right after you guys got in the Indian Ocean where you were on a small island, and yeah. then you guys they sailed for several days, right? Yeah, uh, the one that's high river now is 32 days back from, back from Tahiti, and that's just because we ran to no wind by from an old road near the equator. Um, so it's either can be no wind or like crazy storms because if you think about it, it's like heating up water in a pan, right? Yeah. That's where the sun is the most concentrated. So everything just wants to go up. We don't get trade winds like this, right? right? All that hot air going up is actually kind of what creates the trades that are latitude. Sure, yeah. But at the equator, it it's just up. like dead calm and like super overcast and like the gnarliest conditions for storms. It's crazy. Yeah. The moon, the line it makes. What is the moon essentially that we can see it lit up by? Sun, right? Now it's visible. So essentially, the moon's lit up by the sun. If you follow the, the line, the cut in the moon, it should point toward the south. Because it's being lit up by the sun, which our reference is right here, the east or the west. So the angle is here. Yeah, a little bit, but a half, but a half moon, it's usually pretty accurate. Yeah. All right. I think I saw the Iokepo Guerrero Ohana on here. We just dragged Uluvihi back up onto the beach. We've got some amazing uh, video from there, some awesome lessons from Austin Kino. So awesome to have you join us on Zoom. And uh, yeah, we're just settling back onto the beach. So uh, happy to hear any stories that you all have from this morning or questions but we're, we're gonna just let people get settled here some of us i think might be Melissa, do you need to head back soon some of us are gonna head back um we do have lauren rothfino she's gonna come visit us i think austin's gonna talk story about star compass with us for a little bit so tune it stay tuned in um stay with us and we'll get started in a couple minutes mahalo everyone This is our star compass. We're kind of talking about it, but when you're out at sea, out of the view of land, what do you guys think the outside of the circle represents? What can you see? Ocean, right? The horizon. It's all you really have out there. So that's <clears throat> this system is different than we're on than we're used to understanding directions. If I had to ask you how to get back to your house, you could tell me waypoints, where is to turn left or right. All of that direction finding is kind of out of, out of out of play where we're at. So the first thing about this, it's still really the hardest to comprehend is that when we're out at sea, we're always at the center of our compass. So we know we're moving. We know we're moving over the, over the curve of the earth. We know we're going fast every day, but directionally, you always are understanding like you're in the center and everything is around you. So that's why whether it's a manu to represent that or the kudun, we always are making choices and directions from the center. Okay, that's like the first thing to kind of understand about the system. So based on what's happening around us celestially, right? Sunrise, sunset, stars rising, star setting. Everything we observe in nature has a home in the star compass. Wind and waves, right? So waves can come. Remember I said if it's like a... This is our north east, right? Coming out of this house. The wave will come through, pick up the canoe, 
go look and then travel out the opposite way. That has a direction. The sun, the name, so we'll, we'll go over some quick names real fast. So the, the word to um, arrive, if you are arriving, that's how they used to think about it. Everyone say hikina. Hikina. Hikina, right? So they would see the sun as soon as it break the horizon said, oh, the sun is arriving. Okay. It travels overhead and for facing where it enters. If you've ever been outside, oh, you know, it comes to your house, they say, Komomai, right? So where the sun enters the ocean, it's called, everyone say Komohana. Komohana. Okay, so what, what direction is that? West. West, right? If you're facing Komohana, if I stick out my right hand, the word for right in Hawaiian is Akau. Everyone say Akau. Akau. What direction is Akau? North. North, right? If I stick out my left hand, the word for left, you have to be facing Komohana for this to make sense. A uh, word for left is Hema. Let's say Hema. Hema. South, right? So those are four directions. And we kind of just use a very easy example that if, say we want to travel exactly Hema, and I see the sun rising, I have my 90 degree angle here on the canoe. I position myself at that corner as a navigator. I can keep turning the canoe, keep turning the canoe to boom. I'm lining up the sun right off of, right off of one of my yako or the spreader. And I know I'm traveling south, right? And then the next thing you do is, as you're observing nature, you say, okay, I know the wave today is coming out of Manu. Cool. So, okay, those, we learned four names. Um, there's 28 other names, but it's real easy. So, no, because watch, it's super easy. It repeats. So, sorry, Hikina. Let's work our way south. So everyone say la. La. Go like this. What is la? Sun. Sun, right? So notice there's a la in the south and there's a la in north. So that's because we know the sun doesn't always rise exactly east every day of the year, right? Because of the tilt of our earth, it moves a little bit our, from our orientation, moves a little bit to the south, and moves a little bit to the north. So right now we're exiting our, let's just say it's winter. Do you guys think the sun is more in the south or more in the north? What do you guys think? I'm on. If we're in winter, right, then the sun is in the south, right? So if we see that, if we saw the sun rise, it's probably not the east, it's probably still working its way back up, right? And you know what? Because we're in the northern hemisphere. Okay. So La, that's the first house. The next one is Aina. What is Aina? Land, right? So the reason that house got its name, I heard, is because the star Hopulea is what's called Hawaii Zenith Star, meaning Hawaii is at 21 degrees north of the equator, right? Hokulea, if this is north, uh, this is east, due east, is, let's just say it's zero. Hokulea rises 21 degrees north of due zero. So let's just say it rises kind of where that chimney in the house is right there. When it's at its highest point, it's right over Hawaii. So it's our zenith star. So we say if we find Hokulea and it lives in a house Aina, we're going to find land. Okay. Uh, Noyo is our next house. So we usually just make like a bird symbol for the kids. Then Manu. Nalani is the heavens. Naleo is the voices. And Haka. Haka is like the empty places. So near our poles, near our north and south pole, there's not a lot of stars that we use for navigation because they do these really quick little paths they don't have big long paths from our vantage here okay but look this compass can be folded in half this way and in this way so if we start it goes la aina noyo manu nalani naleo haka then we get to hema right we already learned that was south now look it flips it just folded haka naleo nalani manu noyo aina la get komohana and then do Starts a pattern again. La, Aina, Noyo, Manu, Nalani, Naleo, Haka. And the reason, the genius of this is a star. So let's just stick with Hokulea because we talked about it. This is kind of confusing for most people. It took me a while. If I'm telling you that Hokulea rises in the house of Aina Ko'olau, it rises not through east, but one house. This is how this works, right? Because we don't want to be so specific or like, What's 21 degrees? I can't measure it, but we use our hands. And for me, this is about a house. If I look out, that's about my 20 degrees. So let's see, that's east ago. That's east. That's la. That's aina. 
right, from my vantage on the canoe. Hopefully, I should be rising somewhere around here. If it rises in Aina, in the north, Aina Kola, where do you guys think it will set? Aina in the west. So most of the time, I would think Aina Kona, but no stars. The only thing that do is stars don't cross this east-west line. In the sky, stars, if you think about it, right, you see a star rise. They don't go that way overhead. They stay in the north sky or they stay in the southern sky because it's just about our rotation. We don't, the way our earth rotates, we never see a star go over and cross this east-west line. So you're correct when you said Aina, but it's Aina in the north. So it rises in the northeast. It sets an Aina in this northwest in Ho'olua. Okay. That's why the name mirror itself. So it's easier to think. Okay. I know where it's rising. So here, remember I said, okay, that's east. So one house, La, Aina, I see Hokulea rising. Hokulea, when it's setting, it's not setting during west. It's setting one house, two houses north of what? Okay. So we are, we can already, if I start to see it coming down, even though it's high in the sky, I can already start to kind of get a bearing. Well, I know that's northwest by how much? Two houses. Right? So stars that live in the south stay in the south, stars that live in the north. But what does travel through the compass? We talked about a little bit. You always have it, but it's really hard to read. Wind and waves. Wind and waves pass through the compass. They, they move differently than stars. So if a wave enters our compass from the Lani, Kolau, comes through, makes its bumps, right, along the surface of the ocean, lifts our canoe up, rolls under, it exits at Nalani on the opposite side. That's why the names are similar because it keeps that pattern, keeps it simple, right? From so each house, you can draw a straight line across the across yeah. the compass to the same house in the other quadrant. Right. Yeah. Makes it makes a little more sense when you're out at out at sea, but this is kind of a different way of, of trying to organize things that we observe to not just be like, oh, cool, there's a wave on that side. They had to come up with a system saying, we don't know what direction that wave is coming from unless we had, oh, we know where the sun is. Now we can give that wave a direction and we have a name for it. It's not just coming out of northeast, somewhere in the northeast. It's coming out of this house, right? So that is an old system. You know, and I know what kind of hybrid this, like I said, they didn't maybe have this understanding of this 90 degree angle. That was more of his being able to put that in there. But they used to have this thing called Lua or like Lua pits. So instead of houses, they would call it, um, oh, this star is rising out of this pit, transferring over sky and then setting in this pit in the ocean or something. You know, they had that concept of things living in houses, if that makes sense. Do you have any questions? I know it's kind of a lot. I think but, a, maybe I missed this, yeah. but how come the, um, like, I guess cardinal compass is like at like a 45 degree angle to the houses. So there's north, south, east, west are at a 45 degree angle to the houses. Yeah. Or is that just like, see how like Kona is like. Yeah. So Kona, uh, these names are actually just the names for the four, the quadrant. four quadrants. So I could separate um, southwest, oh, southeast. Yeah. The, the houses names are out yeah. here. Right. Right. Yeah. So the quadrant names kind yeah. of match the type of winds and where they come from. Right. So actually, if you think about it, what is when you have Kona winds, we get it. That's from the southwest, south. right? Yeah. Uh, these other names, you know, I wasn't there. There is a book somewhere that talks about, you know, this is all kind of names. Some were really old names, but a good amount of it, too, is they kind of came up with it, like in the 60s when he was building the compass. Got it. But now all throughout Polynesia, I mean, in every language, you know, in, in Maori, Samoan Tongan, they have a version of this just with they name it, how it sounds um, a little bit different to them, right? Would this change based on uh, like being on Big Island or Maui or no, something like that? No. works anywhere in the world. So that's the cool thing is you can take this compass and understand sailing in New Zealand. Mostly we'll see it, it works everywhere in Polynesia that, that around these latitudes, not too far. I mean, once you get to the poles, it gets hard because stars move in crazy angles, but well, my favorite thing to ask students yeah. is, if you're on the North Pole, where is the North Star? Right. Directly overhead. Right. So how do the stars rotate around you? Yeah. It was like this. So it doesn't make like much sense. Yeah. And then I ask them, if you're on the South Pole, where's the North Star? Yeah. The other side of the planet. You can't see it, right? Yeah. So it's kind of a cool thing to ask people because 
it gets really tricky when, like you say, when you get above 45 degrees, especially, yeah. If you look at the equator and you look at the stars at night and we just create the ceiling, all the stars would rise in exactly straight lines, right? But because we're in Hawaii at 21 degrees north, if a star, let's say it started this point right here and it's living in the north, it would actually rises from our viewpoint at 21 degrees. So that's another thing to, we have to think about is what is the latitude where we're sailing? Like in New Zealand, it's crazy. We're in like 42 south, right? So if you see like a star up in the sky, you recognize it's going to set at like this crazy angle. It's really hard to track and use it. But near the near like Tahiti and stuff, like most of the time we can already start using some stars when they're pretty high, you know, good high up. Well, just look at the sun. It rose over there, right? right and yeah. look at it right now up here. And then it's going to come across like this yeah. and then it's going to set way over there, you know, like that yeah. later. Yeah. yeah, so this system where the moon's getting set. Makes, makes sense um, for navigation all throughout the Pacific. So what's cool is this is the first thing we learn as navigation as as students. There's, an, there's another thing here, the bird. They always use the visual of a bird, and this is something else we have to talk about. But it's it's intentional. And the reason they use a bird is because a bird has eyes, tail, but has two wings, right? So let's just say we're sailing to Tahiti. Tahiti is, if we're gonna get technical, our our heading when we were navigating was Naleo. Mal and I. So it wasn't so he wasn't due south. It was we sailed a house, two houses to the east of south. <clears throat> Mostly because we were kind of slide slipping the whole way. Hopefully it doesn't have these big dagger boards. So we aimed more to the east so that we would kind of slide into our target. All right. When we were following, let's say a certain star as we were sailing at, if all of a sudden it gets cloudy, you lose that star. You better have been seeing what's off your sides because even though now you can't see, you should have known what's off this wing of the canoe and what's off this wing or what's behind you. So you should always have, as you lose certain bearings in the night, oh man, I was really, the star was so bright, it was setting perfectly, but now this cloud system came through and I lost it. You're not lost. You have what's in front of you or what's off this wing or behind you, okay? So that's another really cool thing that they always encourage us to do is not just use one thing to be sailing off of right it's really easy like if you're in the northern hemisphere to just use the northern star it's super easy to find it's up all night because the northern hemisphere we're all rotating around it it's not necessarily going to set it doesn't set for us but if certain clouds form and it covers it like okay what else are you going to use now we're all like uh we weren't paying attention to what else is around you know <laughs> Oh, yeah, and you guys have any other questions? This kind of makes sense a little bit. It's a pretty ingenious system that he learned. I know I learned from Papa Mao, and Papa Mao would have been teaching this honestly with little white coral drawing a circle in the sand. And his names sound very different, the saddle wall names. And essentially, it's the same system. But I know I know going to, you know, being trained in Western math and science, and we all were, had to put a little bit of that understanding so it could be translated. So that's where the 90 degrees kind of comes up. The canoe is actually really accurately marked out. We actually use like a transect to mark out certain angles of these houses and we'll actually physically on Hokulea like mark them with tape. So if say we're sailing this point and, and, and I know I see a star rising in Aina Malanai, we can hold the star over a certain piece of tape on the canoe. It's like they light up, so we shine our flashlight down. Other, other than that, you kind of just have to hope your hand is calculated right. <laughs> <laughs> but even that hand thing, if you're removing tools, he kind of thought of that. He did the math and went out to a telephone pole at his house and stood so far back and then marked these tape lines up and said, okay, I think this is six degrees. And then shot, I think this is 10 degrees. For me, 21 degrees is actually no joke. It's my shaka. So when we're sailing back to to tea, but you gotta stand the same way for me. I gotta stand with my shoulder square, put my thumb right on the horizon. If I stretch my pinky as far as I can, if I see the North Star, top, that's for me. That's 21 degrees. We're in the latitude of Hawaii. We should be home. looking for islands. <laughs> if not, if we don't see islands, then we're way off somewhere. 
but which it kind of was scary when we were navigating back to 32 days um there's three of us navigating as as apprentices and we're all like man do you have 21 and yeah i got 21 did you see this sorry like and we couldn't see an island we we're going crazy i think the captain kind of knew where we were because we might have I mean he didn't tell us but he just has to start monitoring some like like fishing channel you know make sure you're not running a boat and so we're looking for island, couldn't see it and it's because the weather was really bad but as soon as night happened the lights of Hilo came on and we were like five miles off it was crazy because we just couldn't we couldn't see it on there was so dark and there's such a storm system in front of it but we we're like man we all had the same thing and we we're getting pretty frustrated looking for land and then boom the lights came on we we're like yeah we found it <laughs> we found it uh, so a couple of cool things is when you're navigating through Tahiti or something, you're not going to hit a big island first. You're going to hit a string of atolls. And what's the tall? What's the tallest thing that these things have on it? Not big mountain. A new tree, tree right? A new tree. So even with super good eyes, you got to be within seven miles to see a coconut tree. Otherwise, it gets full horizon. You can't see it. Yeah. So that's when we start talking about again birds. If we follow certain birds in Polynesian, we use that manuoku, that white turn, right? The birds range is they can fly about a days away, maybe about a hundred miles or so from the island, but they always return. They don't sleep on the water. So now it's called expanded landfall. Instead of looking for a target that's seven miles big, we have 107 miles. So we have a little bit more. So when we're getting near to where we're counting our stars, we said, okay, we should be around maybe 13, 12 degrees south. We start looking for birds and hopefully it's it's kind of trippy like right at sunset they make like this line in the sky of just where they're all diving into this island it's, it's like you just kind of look for it you see the island cool but if you can call it say navigation over but if not we actually will shut down sails and wait till the morning because why you don't want to sail into the island overnight right so back there's a couple of cool stories about i'm not sure what island they were looking for and um they woke up They'd seen kind of birds the night before. And the next morning they flew up and they saw a bird uh, flying over them, the same direction they were sailing. So they said, shucks, it's going out fishing. We must have passed the island at night. And it was Papa Ma who had super good eyes, I guess. He says, yo, try to look in the mouth. And he saw the bird already had all these fish. So it was already done fishing first thing in the morning. It was going the same direction. They, they still had it hit the island. But otherwise, if they saw a bird going the same way as them, they were like, hey, shut the island back there. <laughs> so there's like cool stories like that. Awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you, Austin. What a treat. I don't know if we have any questions from the Zoom. Let's see. I probably hung up on them a while ago. You guys still there? On pause. Oh, no. No, they're there. <laughs> I we're still here, Kumudan. Oh yeah. Yeah. So right now it's setting like I can watch. You see the team come here, yeah. Yeah, and so yeah, now that I'm How's the audio for you all? Can you guys hear everything okay? Yep, a my bit of a test. My cut e. All right. It's awesome. Get a good shot of the star compass too. We're gonna take a little bit of a break and uh, then go meet Lauren, um, who you all met on Wednesday night in our session but uh, we're going to help get cleaned up here um but i'll just keep the zoom on and hopefully stay connected and, uh, uh, love it when i heard the naleo like that when we started the first was like know when essentially when as students we're we're sleeping we're taking breaks and switching off but traditionally the navigator doesn't sleep for the whole voyage right they don't take these cat naps and so when i know did it for his first time to he, he, he actually did that he didn't sleep the whole time he took these like 15 minute kind of power nap but he's not really allowing so just to fall into a ramp so you kind of get a little goofy i mean he's still doing what he's doing he's not having to do anything else but navigate and he would say that he starts to kind of hear the voice of his sister who's alive and stuff but he 
would like hear voices like when they were little kids or they were talking to me. So Naleo, you start to kind of, it becomes a real spiritual thing. When you're that highly trained, and the consequences of your responsibility are so great, you see, you get into this whole other state of being able to kind of like a survival thing. But it was, it was really crazy. He said he got to Tahiti, that he didn't even go to like the welcome ceremony. He got like put on a plane. He said he like fell asleep in his meal on the plane. Like for real, just crashed out. They brought him here and he had got something in the mail that was like, they were getting ready for another voyage where they needed like, you ever see those suits that the crab fishermen wear if they go overboard? So like he put it on to try it on and it was warm. So like he fell asleep, he said for like three days. <laughs> For real, like, didn't like, he's like, I don't know how he'd have to use the bathroom, but like, his parents would come check up on him, but he was just asleep for like three days. So, <laughs> kind of, yeah, yeah, just after that, being awake that whole time is crazy. So, you can go look up YouTube old footage, like what he looked like when they were coming in. I mean, he was in his 20s, like, it was essentially the first Polynesian in 800 years to navigate from Hawaii to Tahiti. So, it's quite a feat, and it's so cool. Mm. That's why I love this place on here. So, it's not only is this his home and where, but this is one of the places they came to study, right? So, you know, talking about stories and things like this is one of um, him and Papa Miles, their, their navigation um, learning spot. I love it. Yeah. So that's why every time we bring students here and, you know, Auntie Laura, his mom has passed, but they always wanted this place to be continued to use for education. Otherwise, people don't know the stories and they just come here and think it's just a beach, but it was a, it was a classroom. Right? Yeah, oh. she, she used to have her horses down here. And when she was a girl, actually ride her horses through the road to, to Sandy's. All, all, all those. <laughs> yeah. So that's how she has that picture that Chris Kramer so has. Probably from like the early 60s or 50s where there's like three or four horses that were just drinking fresh water all the way out. It's crazy. Super cool. I kind of got chicken skin just thinking like maybe the vision, part of the vision, right? And it's connected to Huli, it's connected to Auntie Laura, you know, and, and her involvement, engagement with education in this area for so long, commitment to that. Um, Alama Mauna Lua, so many folks out, like really thinking of Mauna Lua Bay as a classroom, right. yeah. as a place of learning. And that could be, you know, that could be a really powerful story for us to share on sure. the story map. So absolutely, yeah, I love that. Yeah. It's cool. I think there's so many people that live on the side that probably, I mean, just drive right past it. I used, a lot of friends, since this canoe, this law has lived here, I think a lot of friends that have, especially during the pandemic, that were kind of already hunkered down, but like, I need to get out of the house. Can I take my kids? Oh, yeah, of course. And then they're like, oh, how's this beach over here? So they start coming. <laughs> I think all the neighbors over me because I keep introducing people to this beach and they keep coming back. It's awesome. I mean, <laughs> shit, it's such a safe beach for kids or, you know, bring animals and stuff. <laughs> Cool. So what time, um, what do you, who are you guys talking to next? To Lauren Roth, you know, okay. she's going to meet us down at the access here in a couple minutes. I'm awesome. not, I can look at the time. Let's see. I can smile at our, at our zoom friends. I actually can't see the time on my phone, but it's oh, it's 930. So is there anything we can do to help break no, the no, canoe I down? Or my, anything I, like that? All good. Yeah. Can we just offer a real mahalo to Austin? Yeah, that was really special. Oh, easy. Hey, thank, you, hey, thank you guys for coming, getting me on the back on the water. I can't believe you're in by myself. So. <laughs> I it, love it. It's been a minute since I've sailed. I bet you could, actually. I don't think Come so. On. <laughs> He's training at, in the fire department, so Austin's, Austin's uh, doing yeah, something. Yeah, other important work. Training. A whole new set of Getting skills, yeah. Here. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks for right taking on, the time. Appreciate Easy. you. No problem. Enjoy your day. Yeah. And then get in contact with Dan if any of you guys want to go sail. Um, I, I mean, I can see my number two, but yeah. Also, who? Yeah. Just Google who the movement. I'll make sure the link is up on the in the next email and also on the Mighty Networks page. Oh, perfect. I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay on the Zoom and just make my way over to those concrete blocks. That's the access point. This actually might be Lauren now coming to join us. So. Um, we might not make it all the way down there, but that's where we're going to end up down by the access and it's okay. We are going to, we're going to stick around. Oh, you guys, is your finger okay? My finger is okay. okay. Yeah. Safety first. All right. So we'll be, we'll be back in just a few minutes. I think our awesome three R water follow the drop friends are just now getting here. So, or maybe they've just been hanging on the beach for a while. I don't know. Oh, how are you guys? I'll stay. Oh, I'll stay. Well, we are. We're on Zoom. The, the 
uh, Ohana Iokepa Guerrero, who was on Wednesday, yep. super interested and excited about the app. Nice. Um, they're on with us on Zoom. And then Austin just took us out for a great sale. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, pretty beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful day. We, we scored. Could have been rainy and windy and nasty. And we had a little wind out there, enough to, enough to pull us across the bay for a little bit. So um, this is funny. This is, I feel really awkward <laughs> holding, a, holding a microphone and a camera. Very and, you know, yeah, very yeah, like, this, is, this is what I do every day, actually. I was going to say, like with the microphone and setup. My friend Mike gave it to me last night. He's like, yeah. it won't work. If it's windy, you won't hear oh, yeah. anybody. I was like, OK, yeah. hook me up then. So this, that's what we're doing. Um, we were gonna, the um, Brooke Lockridge and Mark Lockridge have the home right next to the access. Okay. And they are happy to have us, um, maybe depending on how many people kind of go, mm -hmm. however many iPads, I guess, yeah. plus the two of you. Yeah, well, we have two and we have two. We yeah. Like of each other. So, yeah, um, if you each wanna take like two or three yeah. and, and do the assessment okay. yeah. and, um, that's and I'll follow along yep. so that uh, Ohana Iokepo Guerrero can yep. hear from you guys what we're doing and um, try to showcase what's happening on the app. And yeah, okay. just let people kind of gather their things. So a couple of folks, I think Jack and Alex have to go, but okay. it's I, I was a little nervous about asking Mark because of yeah. COVID and everything right, else. Right. So yeah, exactly. kind of better if we have a smaller group who's stoked on learning it. And yep. you guys can head out. Oh, thanks for having me. That yeah. Was so fun. Oh, thanks for coming. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. Lauren, Jack, do you remember Lauren? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You were the. I don't think we've ever officially personally met person. Jack's always behind the scenes, making magic happen, making magic happen. I actually exist. I promise. Yeah. Remind me, Haley. Oh, sorry, Haley. Yeah. Awesome. Haley, Jack, Alex, Henry, you out too? Are you gonna? Okay. Getting hungry. Yeah, man, I didn't know it. Level of commitments only lasts as long as the stomach is full. The morning buffet on the boat. Yeah. No, we didn't set it up. I should have. Not my style. Yeah. Should make everybody sweat it out. Yeah. All right. Aloha, you guys. Walk back safe. Be good. Thank you, Henry, for your help. I'll send you that link if you can okay, upload yeah, those yeah. To tomorrow or Monday, whatever. I'll get them, man. It's all good. Anything specific you want me to do with the drone shots? Um, there's a Google Drive folder if you don't mind yeah. uploading them. I'll send you the link as well. Is that Todd Tellison? Yeah. Oh, I didn't recognize him for a second. That's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, wow. He's, got a He's getting like big. A teenager. He graduates high school this year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. He's in my, he has to suffer through one of my lesson. courses. Yeah, that's right. Are you still teaching at Midpac? I'm at Midpac, yeah. yeah. I think I'm almost done. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've been trying to retire since I started, but. Right. Like How's everybody doing? You guys want to say hi to the Zoomers? Oh, look at that coconut. That mew is going to be good. Crack it open. There's no water inside. No? Drained no, already? Just, it's tight enough. That's why. Because it's young. So I think it's, mm. there's like even no space for you to hear it. <laughs> oh, I love it. So essentially what we're trying to do is, is as um, Dan mentioned, we're partnering with Malama Mauna Lua. And what we're doing is we're offering these free rainwater assessments for people's properties. And the whole idea is we're trying to identify um, where stormwater and rainwater is being, you know, coming off their property, whether it be their roof or their driveway. Most commonly, it's going to be a roof for a residential property. And, what, and we want to find opportunities to capture it. So the app is going on basically, um, normally we walk around the house looking at looking out for gutters. walk around the house to see where downspouts are, are located because that's where basically the water is coming off the roof and out from and um, with the app we basically um, we can probably split up but basically we're going to confirm the location and then what we'll do is when we f identify a downspout we can take a photo of it and line it up with an icon that we see on the bottom and then what it's going to do is take us in um, how many people have used like google earth like the polygon tool with google earth or know what it is um, it's really simple so basically it, it goes into a map a map view and what you're going to do is you'll see the um 
the roof from you know looking down at it and you know you can kind of tell like looking at this roof for example that one triangle is draining this way right whereas one other triangle is draining the other way so kind of by looking at the gutters and the shape of the roof you'll just tap on the screen to draw the area of that roof that you think is going to that downspout and it'll self-calculate what that area is in the app and then we're going to basically just turn on a button that'll say um, bring in the rainfall data for this particular spot and the app will calculate how much storm water is going through that downspout estimated per year and in the back end it's going to um, provide an optimum value for either a rain catchment tank or a rain garden and so you know in this case you know normally with these assessments you'd probably talk with the property owner and see like what they might be interested in. Sometimes they might be like, I don't know what either one of those things are and that's completely okay. And neither, maybe you guys don't either. So I guess maybe that's the next question. How many people have heard of a rain garden? Yeah. Half, does someone wanna maybe explain what they, um, what a rain garden is to everyone? Or give it a try? garden that is i mean it, it does say exactly <laughs> what it is. A, yeah a garden that is uh, capturing rain and and putting it in the ground and into the roots of plants and keeping it from escaping to other places right and then what what would make it different than it going into a lawn right, this guy this guy over here Yep, it, you, see, you will have it planted normally with native plants. Ones that are, that want the water that can get free from water. That want the water. They also need to survive during drier times too, um, because it doesn't always rain, especially down here. Um, but there's also like the, um, there's the way that it's designed, right? Like there are divots and there, um, Yeah, I mean, all that stuff is correct. So basically, um, what it, what we're trying to do is with stormwater is first of all slow it, like get it closest to the source, slow it down. So when we slow it down in a rain garden, we're creating a little bit of a depression. So there's a little bit of retention and storage ability for that garden because if it was just kind of running, it's a big enough storm, it would just run off right off your grass lawn eventually. Um, a lot of times, like grass lawns, maybe not so much here because you got sandy soil underneath. But a lot of times um, they're kind of more compacted. You guys heard that term compaction. Um, so we, you know, we, with the rain gardens, you're creating, actually creating a sandy loam soil inside of it to create that kind of sponge capacity to hold the stormwater for just a period. You don't want it to water sitting there for anything longer than usually 72 hours is max, 48 hours is still a lot. You usually want it to drain within 24 hours, depending on the storm. Um, and so, we won't get into all the technicalities, but there are um, DIY um, how you can build a rain garden in your house. A Puyo Cola Poco made one, a man little manual, as well as um, the city and county of Honolulu has one. Um, but there's all kinds of things you want to get to know about the site. Like here, we can probably say confidently that this is sandy soils, right? So we know that underneath here, there's highly bar. likely that <laughs> we're going to see sand. Which means that's that's well draining soils, right? So that's um, that's a good thing for for rainwater um, like absorption. Um, let's say though you're in an area like um, Manoa or Palola where you might run into more clay-like soils, right? Because at a certain point you won't be able to get actually water to go back into the ground. So um, there's kind of so the app is going to help you kind of size these options. But in moving forward, you would really want to do the further investigation of, um, for example, an infiltration test, which is really just digging a hole um, and pouring a bucket of water in it until it's saturated. And then you can, you take a timer and you you basically time how long it goes down, or it, every inch, the time it takes to go down an inch. Because at a certain point, if it takes 60 minutes or more to go down an inch, 
that means no bueno for recharge. You're not going to get it. So, um, so then you'd want to stick to some other, like the rain catchment option or um, what you put um, in commercial properties more commonly. And I guess sometimes in residential too, is you'll put an under drain, which would mean like it's essentially a, it's a pipe with holes in it. So you get some filtration from the plants and the soil, but then you have an outlet because it won't actually go into the ground. So a lot of times even, again, don't want to get into the details, but if you're doing a permeable pavement system, there's always oftentimes like an under drain underneath there to kind of, again, help get water out so you don't mess with your foundation. Uh, but anyway, so that's, that's kind of the, we're basically just identifying opportunities and, and the optimal sizes for these properties. And then normally we would um, then interact with the property owner to basically, if we can find the survey, we can maybe do that today too. Um, and, and basically it's a survey being like, you know, would you install this project? Um, you know, if it's yes or if it's no, like would you install this project with additional financial discount? And try to see like what would be the motivation for people to actually get the projects installed. And then um, if they want, they, we can uh, keep their project on record so for Maloma Mount Alua later to potentially go after more grants as they kind of capture different projects and maybe can bundle them all together to get um, someone out there to install them. So that's kind of the goal of the project. And then because the data for the survey is just also to help the city kind of figure out what kind of incentive program they would need to create to get people to actually do things. That'll sound easy enough. Maybe um, what would be good, I mean, we can either go on the property or if we want to get in groups, we can just, we can do the app remotely here just for you to get used to how it works. And then we can actually, or we can try to visually see if we see anything standing here and then we can maybe go around and groups or something so yeah, that's good. i think so yeah and that gives everyone a chance to at least try it cool okay we're gonna try to like get set up and identify the property confirm it from here well i mean yeah they can actually run through a whole thing we can just see if we see anything any opportunities like just standing here cool. and then um and then we can go around and i can tell you if i see anything it'd be like uh what is that game for you um I spy or something. Yeah, I, I spy. <laughs> <laughs> and we can all we can pack, yeah. we can draw the polygons. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. We could do yeah. a lot of that here and right, just to get used to yeah. how it works. Let's and then try it. um let's do it. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe um maybe like you guys and then you guys and uh, I don't know, Haley, do you wanna maybe take them and I can take I'm you guys? Try to and turn my camera around yeah, and I'm spy on one of the apps. Is that okay? Me, I don't know if you remember how to use it or not, but you're welcome to come over and try to. Okay, so you're going to start on this landing page. And when you want to do capture an opportunity, you're just going to actually have instructions for each. Um, and so you see how our, our pin is right here. Um, this looks like that's that house, right? You just tap on it. Um, and it, that's the correct address. If that wasn't the correct address, or let's say you wanted to, you're at a booth or something, and you you uh, you, have a house, you can actually go to other and just type in the address, and the pin will go to that house. So you you know so you can do them right, remotely or on site. Um, oh yeah. So this part right down here is is this a residential project? Um, if it's not, then basically you know for non-residential projects to move forward for the city that you would have to hire a engineer or a landscape architect um if what about school for a school there i that's a good question i think they probably will consider that as a non-residential but i don't know i think it's all going to depend on size that's a great question i'll find out though that's a good idea um but if um you know, a condo or a townhouse, you know, you obviously then will have to check with your association. That's the whole point of that. Um, anyway, so just confirm. What's going on? Oh, it's not at me because I, because I didn't put an address and cancel this for a window. All right, so this is where we're gonna um, 
you know, for up there, we try to figure most residential projects are going to be probably an open downspout. So it's a downspout that has an opening. Um, I'm looking and I, I feel like I, what part of the island I, too. yeah, right. Or they may not have any gutters, honestly, like a lot of, which is actually a positive thing. One of the things we're doing, one of the other incentives, yeah, that one has a downspout. I was just looking at this house. I don't know that I see any. Because one of the things that they say um, at the city that they're also going to give you a credit on is if you, um, you know, take out your downspouts. Um, okay. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna do a practice round and then come over. Yeah. Um, Everyone can say aloha and mahalo to Mark Lackridge. Oh, hey. Aloha. <laughs> Uh, so you're studying uh, water? Yeah. So rock? yeah. So what we're doing is um, uh, two things we're doing. We're looking at different properties to see how the rainwater and your stormwater, your stormwater footprint, basically. So how much stormwater is coming off your your roof and your gutters. And then the app optimizes various sizes and types of stormwater solutions. So whether it's a catchment tank or whether it's a rain garden, it'll size it for you to be, oh, op awesome. to be optimum. But then you can put it whatever size in makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so this is being tested with Malama Manalua right now because awesome. with the city and county, because they're are you, are you familiar with the stormwater utility. Uh, the stormwater utility. Yeah. So this is a new thing that's coming up, but basically the city um, will be creating a fee based on the amount of storm water, the amount of impervious surface you have on your property. Uh, yeah. And so, but this, they're picking the app up to help right. people like you to yeah. like at least figure out Mitigate. what your impact is. And then they'll show you how much money you'd save right. by installing something. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so the, the, the elephant here actually yeah. is the unfiltered runoff from the road. Right. So like we had some big rain events mm -hmm. and the, the drains were blocked. It was backing up all on the street, lots of oil yeah. and junk yeah. in that water. And then one of our neighbors unclogged it and I saw black. Yeah. Maybe that helps, but yeah. Right. Is there something we can do to keep like the right? Well, the junk from the road going straight onto the reef. Well, part of the, the the money that they get from the utility is going to help so they can do more maintenance in general on their existing systems. Because right now they only operate on like the property tax and CIP funds. It's never right. really known. were just covered. I noticed with, all that lake yeah because we walked over from yeah Seattle, it's yeah. usually not there but yeah, we had so much rain yeah. uh, and then you know I swim out to the reef just about every day and the water quality was terrible uh, for okay, the last three weeks and um, yeah as you can see there's more damage down that way just like, like algae right everywhere right. you have like if you try to swim the water is, is yellow and yeah, I shouldn't have been doing it probably, but is that the is that coming from the Hawaii Kai? Like probably, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean yeah. Mark, you and Lauren uh should definitely know each other because three R water, she's an amazing entrepreneur. Mark is also an incredible okay. entrepreneur and leading entrepreneur education. <laughs> uh, and and so you guys should know each other. Lauren Lauren's a, yeah. Uh, well yeah, so. feel free to walk in, you know. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to be too intrusive, but we appreciate you and Brooke being still, yeah, so no willing to like Chloe, I mean Brooke's uh out on the water with Chloe. I'm just talking oh, about Chloe on the East Coast. So yeah, no, feel free. Okay. She couldn't even be gone a day. You had you had to call her. We, we're all we, we connect every day. Oh, I love uh, that. That's I good. Yeah. Well, so she's okay. still on Facetime there doing oh, her stuff. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 but I'd love to keep yeah. talking. That's yeah. really cool. Well, maybe Dan can put us in touch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah that sounds good. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. For, yeah, for letting us come. Okay, I should have asked him if he has any downspouts. I don't see any, but um, well, here's the situation if people don't have downspouts, there will be a feature because, like, what the, the reason why I know downspout situation is actually positive is it distributes the stormwater. Then I have the drip line all around the house, right? 
versus like having a single point with a lot of volume coming out. So there will be a little bit, there will be a, a, eventually something in here that'll acknowledge good things like that that already exist. Cool. Like even if people have a catchment tank to be able to acknowledge that they have already a little rain barrel or whatever it is okay. so that people understand that they're already doing some good things. Give them right? a couple stars. Yeah, yeah. right. Some exactly. bonus points. <laughs> but we can pretend there is one at least for now just so you get an idea of how it works um so we're gonna just let's say find we found a downspout oh yeah no worries so then essentially like i you know let's say it's this one say okay we found we found the downspout we'd probably be closer to it right and you're just taking a picture of where you're coming um, is the more important data the icon that you choose? Is that really what provides the information to the app? Actually, the icon doesn't. The more, most important information is the what we're going to do next is drawing the drainage area of the roof and the rainfall data. Okay. Um, but most importantly is the drainage area because that it actually is optimizing um, the value of the size of the rain garden or tank. So. Um, the other thing is that I like to do is also take a photo of like the surrounding area. So you might have it. Well, even if I took that photo, I'd probably back up and like get a little bit of what's going on around it so that you can have an idea of like, is there enough space for something? Is it a big slope? Like if it's sloping too much, you really can't put a garden in because it'll just erode out. Is there some like light AI that's doing image uh, analysis? I actually going to do some AI if you know anyone your little buoy, um, you might want to, because yeah, we want to get AI going for the roof, like just auto calculating the roof. Yep. And um, we'll probably satellite like data from the from directly from the people. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I help help do auto correction of people's polygon drawings. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, a messy polygon drawing. Yeah. Drawing. Um, so yeah, so this part is just like. We're going to be adding this is um you know describe the surrounding area right so and this is again where, where we're going to be adding some more things to it like um is there enough like normally you wouldn't want to put like a rain garden for example within 10 feet up to your house so like is there enough space between you know your right and so most cases in an urban area is probably going to end up being a catchment system honestly mm -hmm. or if they physically remove out some of the pavement in their driveways and replace that with permeable mm -hmm. pavement surfaces so and do they have a wall versus closer what's that a wall versus closer what's that right well i mean so again there's they're in the process of developing the full credit manual but there's going to be opportunity to just at least put your downspout into existing vegetation oh, you right. won't get That's the whole credit yeah. but you'll get a partial credit instead of just directing it down your driveway yeah right so there's still positive things you can do it just may not always equal uh, a rain garden or, but that one's yeah. so easy right if you're already growing a lot of yeah. plants on the property just yeah. divert it to yeah i mean it, like those plants right and and or just through your even to your grass in some instances if it's flat enough it, it won't flow very fast at least over the surface Catchment, I'm sure some people are like, well, what am I going to do with it? Right. Or well, then they have to actually yeah. use the water for yeah. it to be useful, right? Yeah. If you have a full tank and it rains, it's not going to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, kind of another feature we're doing right now is we're developing um, a dashboard. So, like when you log in, you'll know when a storm's coming, and then the city can also put out a notification to empty your tank in advance of the storm, oh, cool. so that the active people like hopefully empty the tanks. Um, so then um, now we're getting to the drainage area part. So I don't, maybe I can let one of you guys give it a try. But you see how the roof area, let's pretend our downspout was like in this corner. And you might, we would be walking around the house, right? To see how the gutters might be, is this gutter going that direction or is it going this direction? But you can see how the shape is essentially it's like a, it's like a watershed, you know, if yeah. you think about it, the roof is like a little mini watershed. When the water drops on that part of the roof, it's going to want to stay in this area of the roof. It's not going to jump over there, right? Yeah. So you have to then walking around, but also through the shape of the roof, which part is going to your downspout. 
thought. So I don't know if someone wants to just give it a, give it a try if you've never. Get it. So what is it? Oh. So um, you're just going to tap on the screen. Tap anyway. So like, let's say we're just doing this. We're just going to draw a, a rectangle. On the See how it does that? It um, huh. creates a, so you try to follow the lines of the roof. So, if, um, so like just tap somewhere on the roof, like mm -hmm. where it's going. Yep. Is well, draw it? the area. Um, so, connect so like, just gonna outline it. Yeah. So, okay. yep. Like, go like, here? Out, you just go, like, do the perimeter of the area that you drag my finger around. Um, you have to right. do a little, well, that would be a lot too. Okay. But we don't have that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Just, yeah, just the point taps it. Connect them exactly. Around. See so how connect it. the points and then. Can do another one up here, I guess. Is she only supposed to tap the part that is for it, the spout itself? Can you drag exactly. it out or no? Exactly. So can you drag out the points or not? Um, you there. can only uh, right now undo. Mm -hmm. oh, those are all uh, great, great ideas. I don't know um, if it has that available or not. Yeah, they're polygon drawing tool. They should update it if they don't. If they don't, right? You should be able to I drag should. all the points. And you should. Them. I mean, I would agree. So, so yeah. So you know, like in this case, they're stealing all our data. They should oh. at least. Uh, I can't do this upside down. This is a hard one because you have to sort of doesn't zoom in very much. Yeah. Oh, you can. Yeah. Okay. You can. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Maybe. Um, oh, you guys are persistent. Do you guys, where's your Where's your downspout? Out sorry, right I, I'm over here. No, no. Maybe Hannah has got uh, more steady fingers. Like you've done oh, this okay. before. I know. I was <laughs> trying to do it sideways, and I think my but some <laughs> some, some here, but, but you yeah, guys, but you guys can give it a try. Okay. Okay. But some downspouts, let's say for example, if your downspout was right here, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, right. it would take this, 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 and you have to go over here and here as well, right? Possibly, right? So if there's if there is not a downspout here. It probably is all draining that way. Right. So you'd have half the work sometimes go to one exactly. spot. Exactly. And, so, and that's why you it's better to be doing this on site so yeah. you can actually walk the property versus guessing. I mean, if sometimes when you're guessing, you know, well, if you're gonna if you, anyone who ends up doing this at a booth, for example, usually you'll talk to the property owner and be like, Oh, do you know where your downspouts are? Mm -hmm. Um, so they'll be like, Oh yeah, I've got one there and I've got one there. So then you're like then you could be like, um, do you click on all the downspouts and then do the whole roof? Or you so we're, so like basically that. we're not doing, we're not clicking on the downspouts. We're, we're basically going um, around the perimeter of the area of the roof that we think is going, going to, to that, that downspout. downspout. Okay. So but you can only do one spout at a time. Yes. So okay. for every, we are only implementing one opportunity at a time. So if it, let's okay. say it's something like that, right? Yeah. Um, every area you draw is for one downspout. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's not a downspout, but the, that whole area is still going to go to that side. Right, exactly. drag it somewhere else once it's um, been done? Uh, we would have to go back. Um, I mean, unless you, uh, we don't really need to. It's basically just so confirming. I mean, normally we'd say, yeah, it's that's our down spot. Oh, yeah. Ooh, okay. And then you can go right. No, you're good. No, because you can't. Yeah, it's one of these weird things where. Yeah, um, or just environment design. Yeah, that's good. Uh, hmm. The weird thing is, is that, like, for example, if you have an odd shaped, um, an irregular shaped polygon, it makes it a little tough. Oh, then you just go in that corner. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Obviously, the first point is irregular. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this is where the AI right would help because then it, it would, I would want it to auto correct. It yeah. So that you don't have to feel, you know, super worry that you're not perfect, you know, in your, in your, well, all you AI enthusiasts in the I know. Get ready. We got a job for you. Exactly. And like it doesn't like the fact that yeah. it's too close to the location. It, exactly. Somehow. I know. So yeah, normally you would want to have your your dot a little further out. Okay, well, sorry, okay. location then where are you? Go like this. Oh. Oh, there you go. Oh. And you can't you can get do it, right? Undo. Yeah. Okay, so, that's pretty good. Um, yep. It's the location thing. Sometimes learning looks like this, sometimes it looks like that.
get into the coconut. Okay, so now we're just going to confirm the drainage area. And um, there's instructions if you guys want to go through each. But all we have to do is turn that button on. And so it'll then show what the, the average rainfall here is 31 inches. So all we have to do, and if you let's say one in an area where we don't have rainfall data, you can also just manually enter it if you and that's wanted to year, enter it. Right? That's per year, yeah. So then, um, or if you did have the data, but you actually had your own local rain gauge, exactly. You could plug that yeah, data in. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, because um, the other piece to this with the dashboard is that we we're going to try to get more real time data, so that you would know during that last storm you captured whatever a thousand gallons well, our valleys something. are so interesting right yeah it's like the yeah diff could, difference could be like a hundred yeah. yards but yeah. it could be significant annual rainfall exactly and the other problem is, is a lot of the rain gauges don't exist anymore so <laughs> um like with like once because a lot of them were in agricultural fields mm -hmm. and so when we kind of lost agriculture we lost rain gauges and then then a lot of the stream gauges aren't running anymore either so um, did you work much with brian blazer a little bit yeah yeah we tried to actually actually he has his um his outfit we have yeah for this area but not necessarily I think that's why we have decent data for yeah this for exactly yeah exactly interesting so anyway, so with that information, the drainage area really times the rainfall, we get this. So it's roughly, you know, 9,782 gallons that we just estimated coming down that downspout per year. Um, if they wanted a rain catchment tank, the optimum value here is about 315 gallons. So just gonna put that in perspective, most rain barrels are about 50 gallons each dish. Uh, so it's a lot of rain barrels, but there are tanks that are 250 gallons, which is what I'm actually looking after my house. Um, and but you can basically input whatever the size that would make sense for you. And let's say they're like, you know, all I really want to do is put in two side by side rain barrels. So then you're like, okay, that's about 100 gallons. And so then what's going to happen is this blue bar graph then comes up and says, okay, you're going to get roughly about 2,789 gallons per year with those two rain barrels estimated. And then, so, and the, and the point is, is you'll then see the difference of, of the volume that you're producing versus what you're capturing. Um, if you want to do a rain garden, it, the uh, square footage is 25 square feet. Um, and so let's just say we're going to do a 30 square foot one. Guess why the blue bar graph never actually meets the total stormwater runoff, even though it's a larger size than the optimum value. So you enter 30 square feet in that you want to do one that's 30 square feet. I'm gonna be, I want to do one that's bigger than what the app is telling me is optimum. Is there is there and let's say I go let's say let's say I go a thousand square feet. Why do you think that blue that blue um, bar graph never reaches that? Because either one you have more area than you have available, or just two because um, you want to be able to water the plants. Okay, so it's mostly to do with rainfall. Rainfall is really erratic, right? And we are, can, we will probably never be able to capture a hundred percent of every single drop. Let's say a hurricane comes in. We're, we're not our <laughs> it's rain. A lot of water it's a care. lot of water, and at some point, we um, at, we just won't be able to capture that. So when we size and design these systems, we are designing them for basically the 90th or 95th percentile rain event, meaning they're capturing the, the bulk majority of it. city project a tunnel or whatever it's not likely that you're going to capture those big storms so that's not a calculation it's just a parameter that's built in exactly you know you're not exactly your exactly yeah. yeah so yeah so i just want to mention that if people were like well i don't understand i can't, I can't ever can't get there yeah because we put 92 <laughs> as the limit we can't right get our, yeah <laughs> the max is actually 90 yeah. percent um okay so then we're gonna submit this project and then we would just name this project. Um, we just go to 18. Go. 
and now I have that, but with that you've submitted projects. Actually, technically, with this pilot we're not submitting projects, but you can also save it as a draft. But it doesn't matter. It just means that when you go into um, there's these different views of all the data we've collected so far with Malamana Lua. So you can see all the all the um, different properties that have been assessed and you can tap on these little graphs, you know, this showing that it's about, what is it where that is? 113,000 gallons of stormwater, none being captured. This one, this one you can see they would capture about you know, 79% of that stormwater with that BMP, you can rank them. But so this would be like, for example, if um, Malama Manalua like gets a grant and they wanna see which projects might have the most impact as maybe one of the criteria, mm -hmm. um, they can maybe look at these projects and assess that. Um, and then there's this list view, which our project now is right on the top. And you can see the status of the project is submitted. So we've been saving these all as draft because technically they're not getting submitted right now. Um, and I and it doesn't matter. I can change that. So later. as a user of the program, do we hit submit or do you want? You're to just probably save as draft. Save as draft. Yeah, and it, you know it's not really a big deal because this is a their own account for this pilot. So it's mm -hmm. we know what's going. We know the data in here is, you know. Are we only yes supposed no. to be collecting um, data from this aquifer? Well, technically, the pilot is with Malama Manalua, so it would be within their range, which is Kahala to uh, Hawaii Kai. Mm -hmm. I was going to talk to Doug because I know you guys are doing a lot of other locations and places, and I mean the whole goal of this is to get feedback from people, right? Um, so if get the opportunity and if you guys if your program has like iPads and whatever maybe you can find a way to download it um, so that you guys can take it to events or yeah whatever. let's talk and see if we yeah, can get the awesome. future navigators from yeah to be right because I mean the whole idea is to get information like kind of what you guys are like why isn't this pin dragging how can we make the app better but also like really the information for the city so that's kind of the bigger that's the bigger goal of it. I love it. Um, so let me ask you a question mm -hmm. as a teacher. Let's say mm -hmm. I have 20 students mm -hmm. and I want to take them to Manoa and mm -hmm. you have it open in that mm -hmm. um, Would I? Would it be best to like have groups of four having one iPad then Zoom that and if they were able to just look at houses and submit it that way just from the street? Or is this something that mm -hmm. you, you want the residential people involved with? Well, we have a survey. So what we've been doing is we'll have one ipad ready with the survey so that immediately afterwards we can get them to fill in the information so it doesn't take too long to diddle daddle to get the survey and what you know what i mean uh, or we just have it literally like on um you know on safari the first thing that comes up you know something like that because we do want to get um feedback because we want to know did they learn something through this is part of it as well right did you you know what was your kind of knowledge before and after and so that we can also kind of gauge like how well this translates over uh, so so yeah in this i know with COVID times it makes it a little trickier um but it could be something um you know what they could do at their family's houses to start oh but think about this idea you have kids who live in condos right no, that's true right that's true i got a lot of kids and there's you have a lot of renters mm -hmm. as another issue that comes up like why rent what am i supposed to do mm -hmm. um and those are all real valid things um and hopefully the on the renter side look hopefully it, if the property owner wants to you know that might be a who knows how often that will happen kind of a thing mm -hmm. so and the condo thing has come up in the past too it's not that the condos can't do projects it would just have to be brought to their association right so um so yeah i guess my question is how people aloha and mahalo zoomers thank you ohana you couple guerrero folks who came to watch this after I hope this was informational with both Austin and Lauren and the three R water team and Huli. I'll definitely share links and recordings uh, and hope everyone gets to feel like they connected with us today. Um, I don't know how the audio was, how the whole experience was. I guess I'll see for myself in the recording, but if you have any feedback, uh, please shoot it my way and sending all the aloha.
Oh, we all. We'll see you later if you tune in. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for joining the Zoom. We're just about to get started. You can see the behind me. All these beautiful people. Will be in the back. Oh, my own son is running crazy around the park. All right, here we go. Alex is gonna take us up. Guys, so welcome to uh, Mount Alua Bay. My name is Alex Wool. I am the director of our habitat restoration program here at Malama Mount Alua. Uh, really quick, just on behalf of our organization and our staff and all of our partners here today, I'd just like to say mahalo for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time out of your Saturday to come and do some Lama in our quick intro I know we are on a pretty tight schedule today so instead of having everyone introduce themselves right now we'll hopefully get to to talk story as we're walking out to Pikeville um, but I also have a couple of staff here today if you need any assistance at all uh, please let us know um, just a couple of housekeeping rules uh, we don't have any restroom facilities down at the Pico restoration site so if you need to go to the bathroom before we leave this this beach park uh, please go even if you don't have to go I'd recommend going um, we do have reef walkers available for all of you. Here, please feel free to do so. We have sizes 5 all the way to 13. We've all been set up simply for your convenience and safety. Um, speaking of safety, please be mindful of everyone else that's volunteering here with the uh, case counts being extremely high. We are asking that all participants please wear their masks while they're out in the water. Um, and just be mindful of everyone's personal space and personal bubble. Um, Don't forget the sunscreen. Don't forget the water. It is going to be a hot one. And with that, I'm just going to do a quick five-minute intro of uh, our organization and what we do out here in uh, Mount Alua Bay. Uh, has anyone ever volunteered with us before at Mount Alua? No? We got oh, some people. Yeah. There's all your boys. You haven't added anyone else? Oh, no. All right. Well, that's great. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, this will be a first for many of you, and we're really excited to be a part of that. meaning to take care of, Mauna Lua meaning two mountains. And so if you look around you today, can you guess which two mountains that our region might have been named after? Or named after these two though. So on the right, does anyone know what this one's called? Maybe we'll start on the left. Does anyone know what the one on the left is called? Go for it. No. Good guess. So the one on the left is actually Cocoaed Crater. The one on the right is actually Cocoaed. But those aren't actually the real place name of these two mountains or these So on the left, we have the Cocoaed Crater. On the right, we have uh, Kuamoho Okane, and there's a whole bunch of other names, including Kuhuki Laotia, which talks about one of the uh, major plants in the region. These are the two Mona that our region is named after. So these kind of look out for you anywhere you're standing in Mauna Lua Bay. So whether or not you're at Wailuk Bay, whether or not you're at Kulio'o, whether or not you're at Kahala or Waialai, you can see one of these two Mauna kind of watching over you. So that's how this region, how this area got its place name. Um, and then a lot of that has changed. Uh, when you drive out to this side of the island, 
which side of the island do you say you're going to? Do you usually say you're going to Mauna Loa? What do you, where do you say you're going? You're going to drive down to Costco. You're going down which side? Come on. Yeah, there you go. You're going down Hawaii Kai side, right? Does anyone know why we say Hawaii Kai side and not Mauna Loa? Kaiser. So back in the 1960s, Henry J. Kaiser came in and he developed this whole region. He dredged one of the largest fish ponds that we used to have over here in Coca Marina, which is about 523 acres large. That fish pond alone had enough resources to feed our entire island population at one point. Um, it had enough fish, enough crabs, enough limu to sustain this entire state. Um, unfortunately, Kaiser came in and developed this whole area. He dredged that marina to make what it now. Yeah. And decided that he wanted to name this place after himself. So he called it Kai's Hawaii. And he's like, ah, oh, we'll make it short. We'll call it Hawaii Kai. So that's why this region is, is called that. And that change in name has just occurred over the last 60 years. 1960s wasn't that long ago, guys. Um, but we refer to this place as Mauna Lua, and that's what we'll refer to it as the rest of the day. Um, what we've got prepared for you is a, a couple of short presentations from some of our staff. Uh, we're gonna just sweep up in one big group since we have a, a much smaller group than we anticipated today. Uh, we have Maddie who's joining us from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology and also our education and outreach coordinator, Laura Bales. They're gonna talk to you all about corals and our restorative resilience project. Uh, so we can make one big safe, COVID safe circle, I guess, around this table. And Laura and Maddie, the uh, floor is yours. Yeah, if you guys want to come up, you can stand or you can have a seat on the ground, up to you, whatever's comfortable. Yeah. If you need to move the tabbies, you can. Yeah, and if, you, if you're if you having trouble hearing me, just like shoot me a line or something. <laughs> okay, so yes, as Alex said, thank you. Uh, my name is Maddie and I work at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Uh, I work in the Coral Resilience Lab. So today, what do you think we're going to talk about? Coral, yep. So how many of you have actually seen coral before? Whether you go diving or snorkeling or just swimming? Awesome, all right. So I actually have some corals here that I can begin to pass around. You can start to take a look at them. But what does coral look like to everyone? Rockish, yeah, what's it look like? A rock with a thing in it? Anyone else? 
think about what jellyfish, man of wars, corals, and sea anemones might all have. Adults can answer too. Don't yeah. <laughs> yes. Tentacles, right. And has anyone got stung by a jellyfish or a man of war? Yeah, did it hurt? Yeah, it hurts. And that's because they have these little stinging sounds called nematocysts. Big word, but nematocysts. And that's what categorizes all of our cnidarians. And so these corals, they have their little tentacles. And then at the tips of their tentacles, they have these nematocysts. And what do you think they use those for? Yeah, you're just full of answers. Yeah, what do you think a coral eats? chili, our plankton, and so I want everyone to be a polyp now. So show me your tentacles. Wave around your tentacles. Yeah, okay. So you're a tiny, tiny little coral polyp. You can't move. You're attached to your, your skeleton here. So you're just kind of waiting for that plankton to swim by you to catch and eat. So do you think that that is going to be enough food to sustain you for the rest of your life? Yeah, our corals are hungry. So they, <laughs> they need something else to help them feed. And does anyone want to take a guess as to what that is? Yeah, the sun. So they utilize the sun because they have tiny little plant cells living inside of their tissues. And these are the little algae cells and they're called zooxanthellae. That's a fun word. You can all say that. Zooxanthellae. yes. So these zooxanthellae that live in their tissues they are providing food for the coral by photosynthesis. Thank you. Yep. So they're getting their energy from the sun and then they're turning that into sugars and then they're providing that for the coral. And not only does the zooxanthellae, yeah. So we have a picture here. So all of those little red dots in that coral polyp, this is a, this is a cool picture. It's taken under a really expensive microscope. <laughs> So these are the tentacles, that's its mouth right there. And then all of these little red dots, those are all the little zoos and bellies. So those are the algae cells that live inside the coral. So not only do the zoos and bellies provide food and nutrition for the coral, but it's also what gives the coral its color. So corals without the zoos and bellies would just be clear because their tissues are transparent and then you just see their white skeleton. So has anyone seen a bleached coral before? Yeah. So what do you think is happening to those bleached corals? Why do you think that they have somehow gotten rid of that zooxanthellae? Yes. Maybe something ate it? Dying because there's no sunlight. there's no sunlight? Is that what you said? Lack of sunlight. Lack of sunlight? Yeah. So, Corals are under a lot of stress right now. They're very, very sensitive animals. And so they only like to be within a certain temperature. And when that temperature of the water gets either above or below, 
below that that um, threshold that they like, they get stressed out. And so what happens is when, due to climate change, when the ocean starts to warm up, that coral, it's it doesn't like that. It's like it's sitting in a really hot bathtub and it can't get out, it can't move, it can't it can't change the temperature of that water, right? And so what it does is all those all that little uh, algae living inside of its tissues. It's, it's loving all this extra heat, all the extra sunlight. And so what the algae is doing, it's actually over photosynthesizing and producing too many nutrients. And so the coral can't actually utilize that. And so it sees it as an issue. And so what it does is it gets rid of that algae that lives inside of its tissues. And you're just left with the clear tissues over the white skeleton. And that's why it looks bleached. And I have a visualization of that, so a few of you want to come up, you can pick a couple corals here that are painted. Yeah, you can pick a coral. Adults are welcome to as well. You don't have to stand there. <laughs> normal temperature water so you can go ahead and feel that if you'd like it's just normal but so we're going to drop our corals in here and then I want you to see if anything happens so if the color changes or anything so go ahead drop it in so is the color changing is anything happening they still look blue to me yeah yeah You'd know it if the color changed. <laughs> Here you go. Okay. So nothing's really happening. We're not experiencing any coral bleaching, and that's because this is just normal water. But what if we put some of our corals into hot water? Oop. Yeah, we're going to cook our corals here. So this is hot water. You can see that steam. All right, and then I'm going to do this. So we'll pick a coral here, and then we'll drop it in there, and then see if that color changes. So we have our hot water and our coral. Whoa! Can you see that? Whoa! Yeah, we'll do all of these so you get a chance to see them. Whoa! It just yeah. turns light the moment it touches the water. Yeah. So it's one really of them didn't change. Yay! So start to think about why do you think that coral is different? <laughs> so we got some corals that, that are bleaching, some corals that aren't bleaching. Super corals! Superhero exactly. corals! They're superhero corals, yeah! So does anyone want to take a guess as to what you think makes these corals different? Adults are allowed to answer. <laughs> yeah? They might be like different types of coral and respond to different heats of the water. Temperatures of the water. They might respond to different. Okay, they might be different species, but I see species of. See, these are the same species right there and there, but that's a really good guess. Yeah. Anyone else? Why do you think these corals, these super corals, what makes them different? that live 
nutrients in their tissues. Um, but that's still like a very new field of science, which is really exciting and it's really awesome that our lab is getting to kind of make some headway on that. But so why do you think it's important to focus on these resilient corals? of 
you just lost them completely. Yeah. So those back to back eating events are extremely detrimental. Yeah. Because it doesn't give them enough time to recover. Have they have there been any like super ideas of like honey cool water from bottom of the ocean to coral areas uh -huh. where you kind of prevent to help save them? Has anyone considered those ideas? I I'm not too sure. I'm sure that like they're probably considering everything under the sun that can <laughs> happen. Right, but the next one, right? Because if the weather conditions right now in a lot of places is really extreme. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so that could mean for us this summer an extreme event, right? Yeah, there's potential for that for sure. Because there are there have been other studies of some kind of things of that nature, but not for coral, right? If we get something like that for coral. Yeah. yeah. Are you saying like taking water from deeper out in the ocean yeah, and so like you pumping it down into shallow areas? Walking out to our restoration site down at the uh, Pico Beach area. Don't forget any of your belongings. We're going to give you about five minutes to gather all of your your shoes, your bags, your water bottles. Uh, use the restroom really quick, and then we'll head on out. We're going to meet over there right on the sand, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Malama Mano and Holy Sin. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I went a little over. <laughs> You're perfect. That was brilliant. To all our Zoomers, I hope that was informational and fun. Um, Maddie and Laura did an awesome job, and Alex uh, introducing us to this place. We are going to actually be walking out to Pico Restoration Area, um, and I'm going to turn off the Zoom. But I wanted to just highlight, especially those of you who tuned in this morning, or maybe we're even out here this morning, just the tide difference. You can see here in Kulio'o, Manolua Bay, we're at a low tide, which is ideal for huki, for pulling limu, but wasn't ideal for sailing that we did this morning with Austin. We'll be sure to send a recap video to you guys' way of that experience. It's really awesome to observe this change in tide and how the whole atmosphere changes over the course of the day. The La'au moon has set, right? The sun's really high in the sky. It's pretty hot out here, but fortunately we have a beautiful breeze. Um, Thank you guys for coming and I look forward to hearing your reflections on this. So please join Mighty Networks, post on there, send me an email. Um, yeah, get excited. I'm excited to hear about how you guys experienced today. And don't forget, we're tuning in with uh, Captain Bruce Blankenfeld uh, right around 6.15 tonight. Um, and I'm really excited for that talk story too. So I hope you can join us for that. Mahalo nui. I'll see everybody next time. Ahuiho. Mahalo. Anyone wanna, does anyone have a good definition of what an invasive species is or know what an invasive species is? What do you got, buddy? Um, it's something that foreigners brought in here. Yep. It's so it isn't that, native. It isn't native. It's something that foreigners brought in here. It's an awesome answer. Does anyone else want to add to that? It does harm to the environment. It does harm to the environment. Exactly. Yeah. So it's something that foreigners brought in. This includes things like plants and animals. Some of the well, more well-known invasive species that we hear about are things like mongoose, are things like cats, rats, mosquitoes. Out here in Mauna Loa Bay, we have invasive algae or limu or seaweed that grows out here. And it's not from here and it was brought here from other places 
um, and it's really starting to take over. Um, so we began this work back in uh, 2007, removing all of the invasive algae because 10 years ago when you came out to this site, this is what it would look like. And this photo was taken. This is a before and after picture of Heiko back in 2009. So this is a 2009 before picture. This is a 2010 after. They came in here in 2009, worked throughout the year in 2010 to remove over 3 million pounds of invasive algae that was smothering this reef. And so today you guys are going to kind of help us maintain uh, the regrowth of some of those invasive species of algae. Unfortunately, because they're invasive, they do have a tendency to re-sprout and regrow. The good news is that we've cleared a lot of the plots in here. Out of the 575 that are in Tycho alone, we've probably cleared close to about 350 of them to the point where we may never have to go back and remove algae from it. We're starting to see the native algae regrow. We're starting to see corals regrow. All right, aloha Zoomers. We are future navigators in the Zoom canoe. Thanks for being here. Um, you can see the sun just went down. We had a nice walk down the beach and uh, we've got a good, a good hui gathered today just to hang out and chill, enjoy the evening. And we're gonna talk story with uh, Captain Bruce. And so, yeah, mahalo for being here and uh, I hope you enjoy. It's a beautiful evening. We wish you guys could join us in person, but glad you're here online. Want to say hi? Hi, aloha. <laughs> we have, uh, I, I should tell you who's on there. We have uh, the Ohana Iokepa Guerrero. Um, we have uh, Fiona from, uh, uh, from Honoka, uh, from Big Island. Oh, neat. Okay. And we have Paige from Hilo. And wow. um, Paige L's from Hilo, and we've got, oh, I'm on there. Oh, who else? Yeah. Oh, we got uh, Miley and Kekupu who are here this morning. So, yeah, we got a good, a great crew on Zoom. This will hopefully pick up the audio. If they can't hear us, they should have come in person. So, <laughs> okay. we're, just, we're just lucky, but <clears throat> yeah. So, I'll, I'll kind of get us started. Um, this is a super awkward and weird holding this thing, but um, no, because then it's awkward to have you holding it in my face. That's weird too. So we'll just deal with it. Um, but this is really, um, oh, careful because the mic will come off. So <laughs> it's a Dan system. So the, you can't really trust it. Um, I just want to start by saying, just say mahalo to Bruce for coming down. He doesn't really, uh, he doesn't really know this and uh, he does it with such generosity and with such humility. But over the last two years, while we've been on in COVID, I've had the real privilege to get to spend some time with Hokulea and Hikianalia and all of the amazing people and volunteers who work on the Va'a together. Um, and it's been a really important place for me to learn a lot. And Bruce has been, uh, Bruce is such an awesome model because he's always learning himself and always like centering on the right values and really trying to solve the right kinds of problems and doing it with his kuleana, taking his kuleana in, in the right way. And um, so I've learned a lot from that. So today I've had a chance to learn from a lot of my teachers again. If you're out here this morning, Austin took us sailing, Austin Kinos, uh, probably quite a bit younger than me, but still teaching me a lot and had a lot of fun on the va'a this morning. And we had Lauren roth out this morning, or yeah, out here with us this morning and the Malama Maunalua gang and the Coral Resilience Lab. All these really cool people came out today and I've really, and I loved it. And I've really been looking forward to just getting to talk story with Bruce, um, get to see some friends, some students, this future navigator Sui that's coming together from all over the islands and really inspiring me so i'm glad that i could bring them together with you bruce so thanks for thanks for doing that and 
I think, you know, one of the things that when, when we chose to do one of these sessions, our first session actually for this program here at Pike Dole, you know, I thought about you because you've grown up right here, like this, this beach, these waters, the bay here, the mountains here, like the valleys, this is all, you're part of it and it's part of you. So I thought, oh, it would be really cool to hear stories from Bruce about this place. And also we're very inspired by the work that goes into becoming navigators and the work that go is involved in voyaging. And we know that, you know, your life has not only had you here about taking you so many cool places around the world and you've brought Hawaii and Aloha in this place with you to all those places. So yeah, just an opportunity for us to kind of talk story and wondering, you know, what's your, what are things that you're noticing or that you remember about the Bay? And maybe we start there. Like, what was it like growing up here? What stories did you hear? You know, when you think about, when you think about the Bay and you think about memories you have of it, yeah, what do you think about? Well, first of all, thanks. <laughs> and thank you guys for doing all this and being a part of it because that's <coughs> um factor is in moving forward is interest, you know, and looking at uh, your world and stuff and through the um learning, the everyday learning and doing and stuff <coughs> and cultivate um a bit of ownership for our environment our space you know and moving forward you know one of the things is it's really good to listen to the old stories understand um how the environment was the people the way they were over the period of time things have changed tremendously and there's no going back there's only going forward but we can always take the best of uh, the wisdom and the knowledge and everything from the past and uh, use it to build into um, the future. Like a, 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 a perfect example is what they did down at uh, Pai Pai Ohe'ia with that, uh, that fish pond down there. You know, there was a breach in the wall from a big uh, flood. The thing was 80 feet wide. That thing was so wide that in um, when we sailed home in 1980, Hokulea's second voyage, Hokulea never had a home. There was no place to leave her. They, they put her, they took her into the fish pond because they wanted to take her to a place to keep her protected from the elements. And they tucked her in the corner and anchored it, knowing that hell or high water, you know, it's going to be safe inside the fish pond. Well, 1983, three years later, they went together. They couldn't find it because the mangroves had grown around it. Oh my gosh. So they had to cut through the mangroves and everything and take it out of there. And um, it's, of course, it's filled up with water from the constant three years of rain. That's a rainy area. And then we fixed it all up and got it going again. But the thing is that that was the state of uh, Pai Pai Ohe'ia, the fish pond at that time. And nobody was taking responsibility for it. Nobody was taking ownership. Nobody was doing anything. And then along comes uh, Hi'ile Cavello and her gang. And they form a vision on um, where they want to eventually see this fish pond. And it like took tremendous amount of work. Thousands and thousands and thousands of man hours of work, you know, volunteers coming down, but they came. And they built the walls and they closed up the breach and they got the makaha back up and it's a and they're clearing the uh mangroves and they're really intent on revitalizing that area that is what i'm talking about is like looking back and taking the best of the knowledge and creating something taking some ownership for it and then moving forward you know a lot of people don't understand maybe can't see the picture but that, these fish ponds, and this is right here where you see all those homes here, that's a Pupa'a fish pond. And that was the fish pond in the Ahupa'a of Niu, right there. And um, unfortunately, at some point, the owners for it filled it in and made um, a um, gated community. You know, it was just a financial decision 
but you know the walls are eight feet thick imagine the the work that it took an amount of stone eight feet thick these walls and these guys uh the you know the uh hawaiians from the land that lived in this area and did that i mean unbelievable and then in wailupe that fish pond really really knew it was massive massive and you're talking like hundreds of thousands of pounds of uh, fish being harvested for the community you know yearly now it's um anyway that's just another story but we had all of these gifts from the past and stuff, you know, and some of them are still viable. And um, so it's kind of our, you know, Juliana, however you want to take it to kind of learn about it. So one classic one is uh, Chris Kramer. I don't know if you guys have heard that name before. So Chris Kramer, he's not from here. He's, you know, from the mainland, came down here, but he really embraced you know, the islands, and he became, uh, he created the Mauna Lua uh, Fish Pond Heritage Site, and they do a lot of work, so revitalizing areas in, in this Ahupa'a of Paiko, so uh, in the back here, uh, there's a, uh, the Paiko, the uh, wetlands, and then there's a Kawainui Pond, that thing, I mean, a uh, spring, that thing is still pumping clean, fresh water, and as, as he cleaned it out and did stuff, they discovered a unique shellfish in their mollusk called a, a hapavai, yeah? So, you know, in the, in the rivers of uh, like um, the big rivers in Molokai and uh, Kauai and some of the other places, they have hihivai that grow in the streams. And uh, they're different from uh, kupe'e and stuff, but you can eat them. But the ones back here, there's a, there's, there was a whole unique endemic species called Hapavai. And because of Chris's effort, and he just, I mean, he just learned about it. He took Kuliana about it, and he really created ownership for it. And um, they're revitalizing it. And then right down the road here, you got Kalau Ha'i Ha'i Spring. And back in uh, 1974, my wife's family has a beach house down there. We stayed down there for the summer. And every day I went out to go surf, the spring would pump so much water that there was a constant river, you know, a river going down to the, uh, out into the um, ocean. And it was just constant, just cool, cold, fresh water going out there. When they widened the highway back in the, uh, the 80s, the second time, they damaged the, um, the um, lava tube. And the water was like all over the place, millions of gallons. And this thing is just like ripping. So they sealed it off. And so they closed off the, um, the fish pond. So, the, so it became kind of like a, a real, it, the health of the, the fish pond declined seriously because of um, the taking away the fresh water. Well, Chris, <clears throat> through his efforts and stuff, has got the state to recognize what they did, you know, wasn't the right thing. So they're gonna restore the water. They're gonna figure it out and drill some, uh, get some, redo it and get the water. But it's not only for the spring, the health of this whole area out here is uh, depend on the, that water. And it did, it depended on those waters for like millions of years. That's what created this whole balance of, of everything over here. So it's things like that. It's just learning about things like that and doing our part and stuff like that. You know, my dad grew up here when he was young in like the, um, in the uh, late thirties, early forties. And in those years around Oahu, there were like big massive schools of mullet that would travel around the island just like how salmon does up in Alaska. And at certain periods of time, you know, they, they taste the fresh water. And through here, they all go up into uh, the fish pond up there, uh, uh, Pupao Mauna Lua, and by the, by the thousands. And my dad said he saw it year after year when he was young growing up and he'd stand on the bridge and you could just see this black mass coming in 
and they're so thick. The mullet was so thick, literally you could uh, walk on them, walk across the water on it, so thick. <laughs> and it went like that for years, you know, and then, and then when, uh, <clears throat> In the 50s, when uh, Henry J. Kaiser, you know, started developing over there, it just changed radically the um, environment. And then the, de the mullet declined, declined. But because of development all around the island, that, that, that incident of just those thousands of, of mullet was here. It was at Kailipulu, Kailua. It was all the fish ponds throughout the um, Kaneohe Bay. And then uh, all the fish ponds in the North Shore, you know, like a uh, fish pond, and even uh, in Pu uh, Puloa, Pearl Harbor, they had a lot of fish ponds along there. And that, I mean, just that's so much mullet they had. We no longer have that. We still got mullet, but we don't have that. And so, so that's what I say, you know, I mean, things have changed. There's no going back, but. There's things that you can do. So there's some, the stuff the guy has been doing over here, and he's, I think you guys took part in a hooky today with uh, uh, Malama Manalua. That stuff has made a big, huge difference to clean this up. So, you know, when, when I was small, I used to come out here with my granddaughter, my grandma's sister, and she used, to, she used to have like about four crab nets. And she just walk out there. She, you know, she'd have her dress, she'd pull it up, you know, so above her knees, and she'd just walk out there and put a trap here, put a, a net there. And she'd catch enough to make, you know, um, some raw crab and stuff. And that was it. You know, and I'd follow her all around with the little net and stuff. You know, I was about three years old. And, you know, it was so exciting. But I used to, I remember we used to do that often. And now, and you know, had all kind of beautiful uh, kuahonu and had different types of crab that they like. I don't, I don't know. They're probably still around. And then also every night, well, not every night, but a lot of night, you see people torching, walking through here. There was so much fish inside the reef that, I mean, it was like a regular occurrence. You know, another story, my wife's family, they're um, in Niu. Her grandfather was a um, cowboy and a dairyman. So in Niu, where we live, he had dairy cattle and then he had uh, beef cattle that he ran up there. And had all the cowboys that worked uh, for the ranch. And one of the cowboys, he had a, uh, I think he had about 10 children he and his wife. And this guy would come out every day to go fishing, to catch fish, you know, for his, feed his family and then, you know, share and stuff. But the interesting fact is he couldn't swim. <laughs> so he would only go up, no, uh, just a, not even above his chest. And then that was it. But he'd go out here and he would be, there was so much abundance that he, he was able to provide you know, for years and years and years. It was like incredible. So that's the kind of abundance that this place held, you know. Um, it's not that fish, but it's not like that. Yeah. So I don't know. That's why I say, you know, as you move forward, it's just uh, the mindset. I was telling dad about, you know, before statehood with territory days, the government still honored and um, respected the Konohiki system. So the Konohiki for that end, were, uh, um, Oko Head is there coming down the edge of this uh, Mahupal. We're in the Mahupal, like the wind. And that whole area, his name was Joe Lutella. And in this area, the Konohiki was uh, Joe Paiko. And then that next one, the Konohiki was uh, Mary Lucas. And then when you go into uh, Wailupe, the Konohiki was the Hind family. And then when you go farther down into uh, um, Wailanui and Wailahiki and stuff, I'm not sure who it was, but uh, the way it worked, and, and this, it, it was like this on all the islands. 
Like if you wanted to go fish out here, you'd have to go see uh, Joe Pico and just say, you know, we'd like to go fishing and stuff. And, you know, if he, he said, okay, go out there. But he, a lot of times they say, you know, this is Papu, this is Papu, don't catch that. And um, other than that, you, you're right. So the guys would go fishing and then they'd come back and say, this is where he is. And they'd come in and they'd, they'd put all the fish down on the grass. Everything that they, they brought in, you know, maybe it was, hey, hey, you know, octopus, turtle, fish, whatever they brought in, right? And they put it on the grass so he could see what they took. And then he would go with his stick and poke. He goes, hey, I'll take this and I'll take that. <laughs> and they go, okay. And they take the rest. And that's how it worked. A good friend of ours, her, uh, she was from Lahaina. And she told me her grandmother did the same, was the same thing. And uh, it would, they respect it. So nobody went fishing out here without seeing the Konohiki. And so with that, there was, um, that was part of the protection of the place because the place was abundant, but this environment is fragile to a large degree. It is, you know, you cannot, you just cannot keep hammering on it and stuff like that. It's fragile to a large degree. Um, but that's how it worked, you know, they respected that. And then when, when statehood came in in 1959, they just kind of like wiped the slate clean and they no longer respected that. And uh, so a lot of changes. But again, yeah, as we move forward, you know, I mean, it's just a matter of like, like Dan made a good point about, you know, listening, learning, um, recreating, um, in your minds and collective, collectively or personally, you know, um, a way forward, a path forward. And uh, nothing's ever wrong with that, yeah. And then um, like what, like a, an example, like Chris Kramer with um, Mauna Lua Fish, Fish Pond Heritage, right? Just creating a path forward and just he's been doing some awesome stuff. And so many people are doing some awesome things. And so um, we're lucky. We're lucky in that way, yeah, we really are. And it's going on all through uh, the islands, but also it's going on around the Pacific and around the world too, you know, people are actually starting to understand that uh, it's gonna be us guys on the ground, the boots on the ground kind of guys that, uh, you know, um, make a difference. So, I don't know. I got to, I mean, growing up in here, like growing up anywhere else, you know, it's always a blessing when you meet people that grew up in um, Hakipu'u and Kaneohe Bay and they got the most wonderful stories of growing up there and all the uh, old timers were and um, all the things they did. Yeah. You know, I was lucky, like my dad had a boat. So we go out. He, he, uh, I lived right on, uh, we lived on Coolio Stream. And uh, when I was really young, when we lived there, you know, late, late 50s, my, my dad uh, and his uncle, I mean, my uncle had built a pier. So that little pier, we could fish, you know. And I tell you, it was awesome because when the water would come in, the mullet would come all the way up there. And uh, some of the uncles, you know, throw net. But the papio would come up because there was a lot of uh, opai all along the banks. And we'd catch opai and we'd just throw out there. And we'd catch tilapia, we'd catch whatever. But there are tons of crab up there. And sometimes the eels would come up there too. <laughs> so right at the uh, post of the uh, pier, you'd look down, you get an eel, and you run inside, tell everybody, hey, check this out. There are all these little kids standing on the pier looking at this. <laughs> that was an environment that. Uh, you know, it was uh, that was before they made they widened the river and they made the uh, the cement like the flood kind of mitigation type of storm drain kind of thing. Yeah, the banks were all stone walls and for the homes and so on and so forth. But it was really it was it was pretty awesome. But anyway, my dad had a uh, after they did all the storm drain, he had a, a fishing boat in there. So at night, like now, we go out fishing. We got some fish for Kule. 
and you, t you fish until the sun, uh, the moon comes up. Because Akule, you fish on the moonless night. Or Akule, fish till the moon comes up, and then we just go right back and park the boat. And we did that for years. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, as you guys know, yeah, you can walk right across over there and stuff. There is no more channel. <laughs> <laughs> But before, uh, in the old time, it was like that too. My dad said the, um, they didn't have the channel. Uh, Henry J. Kaiser, when he did all this stuff, he dredged all kind of stuff all over the place. Yeah. Bruce, for young people growing up in the Bay now, what are, you know, I love the sign, like pointing to folks like Chris and other people who are taking ownership and Kuliana over caring for this place what do you think are some of the some of the pathways that that you hope people you hope young people kind of step into and kuleana that they take or things that you're uh, things that you're thinking about i mean whatever um i don't know whatever piques your interest right so uh Marie kirk has done a lot of work up here and she was um you know, one of the leaders in um, recreating the kuleana for um, Havea Heal back there. And Havea Heal is uh, right there. There's a big upwelling in spring. And um, Havea Heal, um, there's a couple old stories for that, but it's, it's to um, mark that spring and that area. But also one of the first temple drums that came to the islands by La'a Maikahiki uh, went, ended up there. And uh, I think the person who, who um, had some uh, kuleana for that was a sister of Moikeha. And Moikeha was one of the last navigators, last navigating chiefs that came up from the south to these islands. And he came here. And he had two sisters. One sister was Makapu'u. And she got off the canoe and she stayed in that area. That, so that area, Makapu'u, is named after his one sister. The other sister came into this area by the fish pond. I forgot her name, but she's a, a big part of Havea, the history of Havea. Huh. But, you know, Anne-Marie Kirk, you know, I mean, they've done such a wonderful job on, on um, just if anything, uh, recognizing um, the relevance of that fish pond and its existence, and then just cleaning the place up and beautifying it and just bringing, bringing everything back into our space and time and our understanding of our place. You know, I mean, that's important. You know, it's not just a piece of land to be traded to the, for the next highest bidder and stuff. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, uh, history and, uh, and, and uh, heart and soul and spirituality surrounding all of that. And one of the biggest dangers for any place is amnesia, is to, is to forget about it and not know about it and just think, you know, go around, go ahead like it's, it's okay, it's, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not okay. The, it has a life of itself. And when you go there, you can um, just you can feel it and see it just in the beauty of the place and the understanding of it. So, you know, that's uh, so many great things like that, you know, and then like, um, you know, Austin, you know, bringing his va over here and and uh, and he's so good on it. But to share, you know, the, the beauty of it on the ocean and sailing and everything like that is really neat. But, you know, this bay, it's it's a. Uh, you know, it's a playground. You know, we have so many surf spots out here that are like so awesome, you know, and, and um, so much uh, the, the, the reefs and everything are so vibrant. So people like to go um, snorkeling and you know, do things, whatever. You walk out here at night, you still see a lot of wonderful life, you know, crabs and uh, different fish and things like that. Uh, so there's still a lot of life all around us and um yeah we're lucky i mean man we're just lucky to live in hawaii i tell you that <laughs> it's such a beautiful place 
with so much to offer. Bruce Austin told me a story um, about you surfing. The, the way you used to have to surf out at China Walls back before there were any homes out there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you want to tell us a little bit about what Port well, Lock used to be like? We grew up, well, we grew up, you know, when we were kids, we used to go out there and by the finger, I used to go body, uh, pipe board and body surf and stuff. We were like little, you know, like maybe eight, seven, eight years old and stuff. And then all the older guys would be outside by the point. And it, and it was mainly pipoing. But you see guys surf. But as we got older and we surfed out there, those are the years when they didn't have return, you know, cords, leashes. So you lose your board, you're swimming. And you, I mean, when it, especially when it's big, you're swimming for a long time. But, you know, somebody catch a wave and you got one of your buddies and stuff and they go get your board and they have it, their leg dragging and pulling your board out as you're swimming in. And that was just part of surfing back then. That was just how it was. But... Yeah, you would swim a lot, uh, a lot, but that was good. <clears throat> That's what made us stronger and more confident in the water and things like that by having to do that. You know, I mean, you wasn't going to go out there if you couldn't be a, a good swimmer and handle like that. It just wasn't going to happen. Yeah. How many lights, you know, we see, we look over and we see all the lights there in Port Lock. What, how many lights were out there when you were growing up? surfing out there you know when we were young all the way at the point all the cars would drive all the way to the very edge where <laughs> the homes are and they'd just be all lined up over there and would be like the you know the wives and all the little kids and you know all the fathers and the older guys would be out there pipoing and surfing <laughs> and we just that we'd all be just sitting there on the cliff watching them that's how it was, yeah. So there's nothing out there, but but when I look back at that, I said, "Wow, that's pretty neat," you know. <laughs> you know, but but slowly, slowly, you know, the development. So yeah, yeah. Favorite, favorite memories. <clears throat> favorite memories. Yeah, we did all of that. I don't know. If, um, I mean, they're all so, such treasures. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, when we grew up, we lived in Kulio, and when you you just walk. <clears throat> Out into the drive, I mean, onto the sidewalk, and you look straight out, you can see turtles, the surf spot. And then, uh, you know, people would sometimes, some friends would call, hey, how's the surf? So you walk outside, oh, pretty good. And then guys would come down from Kulio, they'd throw their boards in the stream up in the valley, and they'd come down, <laughs> pick them up, <laughs> and then they'd paddle down, because all the big boards back then, the big tankers, yeah. <clears throat> they paddle down and they yell, hey, so hey. Guys throw the boards and then we just paddle out and then just eventually walk and then go surfing and then same thing coming back in. I mean, just fun times. You feel like you just had all the time in the world, you know. And then eventually, just the fishing. You know, we grew up, my dad had a boat, so we go out at nighttime fishing. And what a peaceful time, you know, sit out there like, like now and, you know, you've I really enjoyed those times fishing at night and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> 65. Old time already. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I think I would have fought for was um, was uh, the Konohiki rights. You know, really keeping that intact because those are like, you know, so just 
the Konohiki rights, you know, like we talked about the Konohiki that were the people who had Kuleana for the sort of the, the Ahupua'a system went from all the way to the top of the Kolaos, out past the reef. That's why the guys, it didn't come over here to the water. That's why they asked Joe Paiko if they came here to fish, because they want to go fishing. They go, okay, but it went pa out past the reef. And through that, they were able to, and they're finding this out around the, all, all over, uh, even like through Indonesia and all these places, you know, I mean, this kind of uh, ownership for the place to protect it. But they would, you know, just those uh, rights would have done so much to protect an area, you know. You know, I mean, if, you know, understanding that, you know, I would have really fought for that and stuff and, you know, tried to, you know, maintain that because, you know, I mean, that's because there's two sides to it. It's not only that, you know, uh, Joe Paiko was a Konohiki. Everybody respected it. That was expected. <clears throat> so nobody just came over here and acted like it was a free for all. They could just, uh, you know, forget about Joe Paiko. I'm just going to go fish. No, they respected it. You know, there was two sides to the coin, which was really, which was really a wonderful thing. And so that's one of the things. You know, I think would have would have been on, on a really awesome. The yeah, you know, I don't know. There's there's so much we can do, but you know, like with with what you said, you know, um, there was this guy John Kelly. I don't know if you guys ever heard of John Kelly. So John Kelly, back in the fifties, he and his wife Marion Kelly were activists, and they're awesome. But John Kelly started Save Our Surf. And, and John Kelly, his uh, and uh, Uncle George Downing was part of that. Every time I, I get a chance to talk with Uncle George, he'd tell me the whole story about it. <laughs> but but they were very active in like saving surf spots and um, uh, Kaivi, the Kaivi Coast. He was super active in like, and his wife was like a. Um, uh, had like a PhD, super knowledgeable, amazing lady, Marion Kelly. But they do their research. That's what made a difference. John Kelly and Marion Kelly would do tremendous research. So when they go in with activism to talk story and to argue things, I mean, there are too many people could argue with them because they really did their homework and did the research and they, they, they talked about it. So get, check this out. This is an actual fact. Your Uncle George Donnie told me this. When Kaiser built um, this whole area, he knew that the expansion and the development was going to be so great that the highway wasn't going to be able to handle the amount of traffic. So he had a vision of building an offshore thing al along this whole reef, oh, starting from Kahala, to come around this whole reef and it uh, coming in here. Close it in with a road. Yeah, he was going to make like an offshore oh, roadway. And jo uh, John Kelly and those guys said, hell no. Yeah. You know? Thank goodness. But yeah, those guys were like, I mean, he was way ahead of his time. He was an amazing man, John Kelly. And John Kelly was the kind of guy. And uh, Uncle Georgie, uh, John, Donnie said, you know, Bruce, this guy was a real waterman. This is the kind of guy that could free dive a hundred feet to go down and uh, spear and ulua and stuff like that, yeah. you know, which is like not many people can do that. And, uh, you know, surfing and swimming and the whole bit, but <clears throat> thank gosh, you know, thank God for people like that, you know, to fight for a place and for us guys. Bruce, one thing you talked about is like, all that time in the ocean doing so many different kind of things, right? Right, pipe boarding, surfing, diving, fishing, like, and doing it in context where there wasn't always somebody there to save you. You didn't always have, you know, there just it wasn't like it is today. <laughs> no, like, how do we, you know, and I've gotten to spend some time learning just a very little bit beginnings of like the mindset that we have to have if we're on the va'at, you know, sailing. And how do we bring that, like, because I feel like the ocean has so much to teach us in Hawaii, right? Because we live, we're part of it every day. We're on a va'a right now, yeah, in, on the island. So 
how do we get people to, how do we create an environment where the ocean becomes that kind of classroom again for everybody? <laughs> oh, oh you spotlight. don't want the light in your eyes. No, 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 can no. Turn it off. Want me to? <laughs> Thanks, <Awesome>. Bruce. <laughs> no, yeah. Um. Sure. Can you rephrase that again? The light threw yeah, me off. Yeah, just Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I thought it might help. <laughs> it helped illuminate Bruce, but uh, it also yeah. Um, I think the I think the question is how do we like the ocean was such a classroom mm. for you, and I think for the Hawaiian people and anyone living well in Hawaii for a long time, whether it was near shore or offshore, whatever the case might be, like the ocean taught us so many things. But then now it feels like kind of off limits or it's just used, you know, it's used just for recreation only kind of, oh, or maybe really near shore kind of stuff. But, you know, how do we bring the ocean back into people's lives and kind of reconnect mm. them to that? Oh, gosh. Well, it's there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's there. I mean, we grew up, all we needed was a, a learn how to swim and, you know, and get a pipe board. I mean, you know, this is a classic down in, out there in Portlock, guys would just leave the pipe boards in the bushes <laughs> and you come over there and you just use it, you know, and then you see the owner, oh, well, got to take it back. And, you know, I mean, that guy, they're fine with that. Yeah. You know, just store them out under the bushes somewhere. Yeah, there was just a bush with a path and stuff. And there was a few, you know, boards in there. You just grab one and go. And then if you're there, you could use it. And then if you see the, the, the owner coming and stuff, you just take it back and or yeah. whatever. But it was kind of like that. But the ocean is there. I mean, you know, we just, with nothing special, you know, we got a surfboard and we went surfing. Yeah. You know? And you're still doing it because we, we went sailing this morning. Austin took us sailing. We yeah. saw a six man paddling out there. I said, I bet that's yeah, we were I paddling this Bruce morning. And it was Bruce paddling. And there's a canoe club down here, and there's a canoe club down the other side. And you know, you have all that wonderful access and um you know to the ocean like that, yeah. Um yeah, it's just a matter of like it's it's uh, of getting out there and doing it. So awesome what you guys did today, that was fun. you know, and then there's, and then, and then there is a whole nother um, discipline of shoreline gathering, you know, mm -hmm. for limu mm -hmm. and crab and uh, loli and vana and different things. That's a whole nother discipline now. That's not everybody is real bad to that on how to find the, uh, the limu and stuff like that. <laughs> you got a question? Oh, yeah. um, so, like, if you were to, like, also go back and, like, imagine yourself 20 years from now, standing right here, what did it, what did, like, what did your parents say? Like, you know, how did you grow up here? Where I've grown up here my whole life, but I've just got to see, like, the past change a bit. No, we did not. They had a lot of, yeah, they had a lot of sand area, but then they had a lot of um, the um, the native limu. And um, that was another thing. I mean, when I come up here with my aunt, you know, I mean, she'd set, her granddaughter, she'd set her crab nets and then she'd walk around and pick limu. You know, and they knew exactly what limu to pick. They just pinch it off, pinch it off and they gather it and they do all that stuff. I mean, that was, I mean, the ocean provided that kind of, um, um, I'm not going to say sustenance, but treasures, you know, that you could go home and enjoy, you know, make a big bowl of uh, raw crab with the limu and all that stuff. And just in, with a bowl of poi, I mean, it's just like, you know, they grew up like that and they're their grandparents, their, their moms, and they all the aunties did that, and they, they did that. And then our generation just kind of like, for a large part, just kind of like stopped doing it. You know, you want raw crab? No, you go to the kind of place where they make poke. <laughs> it wasn't, it, no, the beach wasn't this wide. It wasn't this wide. And and all the the front 
uh, the beachfront was a lot wilder than this, you know. Now, every, you know, it's all the yards and ice. And both of it, was, let's go. it was just a beach place, you know. Yeah, now it is. But, but back then, you know, we used to walk down here and stuff. Bruce, I don't want to change the subject too much, but I notice some people are looking up to the <laughs> sky and noticing some things. And uh, I notice we have some. Well, I'm going to ask the guy, Mark, over here. Too. Gee, Mark, get up here. Did, did, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. So you said that when you were younger, you got, your dad had a boat and you would go out. Was it every night? Every night? Or was it like during sunset? Well, we'd go out during the day and we'd go fishing, but then um, the, the type of fishing that he bought the boat was for, for nighttime fishing for a kule. Um, and uh, it was pretty tricky, you know, getting through the channel and everything. Yeah. What, what, um, what did the channel used to look like visually? But, um, well, the, they, always, they had the markers, the poles with the markers coming down to where the ramp is. But then from there to go around to Kulio, oh, you had to know the place really well. And my dad, he put um, he would put some um, Clorox bottles down, and then uh, at certain areas just to kind of mark the the edge of the reef. And then we come <laughs> slow and come in slow. And then once you get into uh, you see the because uh, you come around the reef around the park, yeah, and then you come up into the river. It's kind of like how they do it in on the reef in a lot of Pacific Island communities, right? They have kind of their own little markers on their yeah, reef. Yeah, your own little markers, so you kind of, yeah. it's all local knowledge. Certainly wouldn't go in there if you didn't know the place. Yeah. You'd end up high and dry. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, so so we, let's, we fast forward into like the 70s when Hokulea, was uh, launched in March 8, 1975. And uh, Nainoa Thompson, who's from up here in the Ahupua of New Valley, and I grew up in uh, Kulio O. Um, Nainoa got super stoked on Hokulea and the whole concept of it. And, he, and when Mao Piailug, who was a navigator from uh, Micronesia, that navigated on their first voyage, everything about what he, Mao, Mao did was a body of knowledge that was so magical and so incomprehensible that, um, you know, it was just like, everybody was like, holy smokes. But Nainoa, he goes, I wanna learn this thing, you know? So he took it upon himself. So Nainoa and I became friends when we were in high school. And so that was like in the, uh, the early seventies. When he came back in, from that, because he, he was on the return first trip in 1976, when he came back, unfortunately, Mao Pialug was not on that voyage. He was so looking forward to it. And so, you know, but from uh, sailing from Hawaii to Tahiti, you know, 2,500 miles, you know, back then the voyages took a little longer just because the canoe wasn't as dialed in with its sailing rig. But the beauty of it is you're at sea for like 25 days. You have a whole lot to opportunity to look at the sky at night and then to look at the um, everything during the day and piece it together in your mind, you know, how navigation would work. So when he came back, when we came home after 76, he had a full on quest to learn this thing and, and just put all the pieces together. And so we, so, he had a little boat and we would go out at night to go fish a kule, Naino and I. And we'd stay out there all night and looking at the stars and talking story about the stars and learning about it. And it was like awesome. It was so awesome. I mean, just imagine being out there, like that, that light out, out there and just drifting, fishing, you know, hand line and, you know, catch a fish every once in a while, pull it in, but looking at the stars and stuff. That was a, 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 a wonderful thing. And that was like creating a classroom. <clears throat> so that's why I said, you know, the path that you guys want to get to 
and the vision that you see that you want to um, eventually end up at, you got to create something. You got to create that. You know, you really do got to create it. I mean, other people have done it and they've had some kind of blueprint about it, but but uh, just through the doing this. So we'd go out. He'd go, hey, what? So we'd go out and fish. And um, we'd drift. I mean, look at the stars and just watch the stars go overhead and rise and set. And we just, uh, you know, he's teaching me. So, you know, I'm like, my head is spinning trying to figure all this stuff out. But through his teaching and stuff, he's learning quicker and quicker and quicker. And that's the kind of stuff we did. And it made a, uh, a big difference. And so that's more of a journey. But it's always a journey anyway. You know, getting from like an idea to an actual, um, you know, end result. So, you talk, um, is it okay if we talk about the stars and the navigation stuff? Yeah, please. That's awesome. Anybody got any, any questions? Or other, otherwise, I just want to talk. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot the word of it, but you said that, um, like, John Tycho used to be like, uh, yeah, Konohiki. What, what happened if you didn't respect him? Uh, then you would never be able to come back over here again and fish. Oh. Yeah, like, I mean, those guys were, I mean, they had that kuleana. I, I wanted to mention this, you know, is like there was a, a king on Oahu, his name was Maili Kukahi. And I think Maili Kukahi was from the time of like the 14th century. And he was the one that him and all of his advisors and counselors developed the Ahupua system. And the, uh, the system of like, you know, dividing the land. And part of the Ahupua system, big part was like water allocation and, you know, um, protection, you know, environmental protection for the mountain and, you know, then the sea. But it was such a, a amazing, well thought out system that the other islands uh, adapted it as well. And it, it worked for, for years. <clears throat> and so, yeah, Joe Paiko, he was, a, he was a Konohiki of this area. And so, you know, the Konohiki, they had a big responsibility. They had ownership for the area, but you know, ownership me means that they knew the area. You know, they they went out there and they knew the area. They knew the reefs. They knew the cycles. They knew the fish and uh, the different things. And so, it wasn't so much about controlling it as much as it was about protecting it. You know, and keeping it because a big one big concept in the islands and you. Uh, I don't know if you've heard it, was Aina Momona. You know, it's a, it's a land that is like fat and abundant. You know, and they always strove for that. That's why these fish ponds, when they made these fish ponds, there's like so much fish for everybody, you know, like uh, Ke'alipulu and uh, Kavainui, that whole area, so much fish, so much fish, amazing. Yeah. Uh huh. It's kind of like irrelevant on It was kind of like that, yeah. I mean, you know, but you always had to have uh, <coughs> the Aloha spirit, yeah? yeah. You know, like like so when we were kids, yeah, we surfed all outside here. Seconds, the point, turtles, pikos, we come out here, pikos, and then down to toes a bit, you know, and, you know. And so you get to know the guys and stuff. And in some places you go, oh, you get the guys make you feel uncomfortable. Ah, shucks, okay. <laughs> you know. But, um, you know, um, you know, we surfed, we grew up surfing in Waikiki. 
you know, that whole place. And it was always so awesome. Yeah. But yeah, that way, that, that, uh, that way of being, yeah, that kind of like, uh, like being abrasive to people and stuff. Yeah, it wasn't something that we all, we kind of em embraced. It was just like, ah, well, okay, they're going to be like that. Can I help? You know? So, okay, so I got my, you guys are like this, my laser. Oh, <laughs> no. Really awesome. So, he's a Jedi, y'all didn't know. So, 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 we got the, um, we got a couple of um, star lines. Just watch out for planes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a couple of star lines. So, this star line right here. Otherwise, we're in the news. It's called Kekao Makali. This is perfect because you can see how, what it means. So this is uh, Sirius. It's the brightest star in the sky. This is Aa, uh -uh. and then you come down here to Puana. So this is the this is the hunter, yeah, Orion, and his two hunting dogs. This is the big dog, and it's a little dog right here. So it's Sirius. Okay, so Aa, uh -uh, Puana, and then over here, 